Welcome to the Scarf Begar War, proudly sponsored by the Players' Entrance at Covent Garden Cafe and the Royal Oak Edgerly. Oh, great flick up by Alan Armstrong. Welcome to Scarf Bagara War, Dark Days Part 4, or Part 4A of many, probably. I don't know, we're going to get to Part 4Z at some point. <laughs> this is going to be a long part. Um, I've got to say, my intros aren't as good as Nick's, and Nick's not here to defend himself, so this is this is the best intro you're going to get. So we've got Dave Schofield. Hello, everybody. We've got Dave Espley, yep. formerly Tea Party fanzine editor, for those that don't know. All right, yeah. And we've got Phil Brennan. Hello, that's me. And just for those that don't know, or if this is the first time you listen to this, because we have had some new listeners as well recently, it, 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 this isn't just th- four guys getting together who don't know anything about what happened at the time. Everybody was involved in some capacity, and Phil even works at the club. So everything you hear is, uh, is first-hand, I would say. Just before we start, I'll, I want to go through a few things with the sponsors. Um, so we've got three sponsors now. We've got some nice new shiny kit. Hopefully the sound is better for you. Um, at Covent Garden, which is a cafe on Lower Hillgate. Get yourself in there pre-match. Really nice breakfast. I've been in a couple of times now, and it's really good. Nicely priced, and they do open Sundays as well, so get in there for your hangover cures. The player's entrance on Mersey Way as well. Um, that's run by a county fan. He's trying to get as many county fans in there as possible and have a real connection with county fans, so um, he's open Saturdays and Sundays and, and throughout the week, I think, as well. Yeah, the, the, uh, the team went there on Monday. Yeah, they did. Yeah, the team went on there. Um and yeah, I think um, Nathan Aspinall's uh, 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 he's joined partners with them as well, hasn't he? He was there uh, as well. Yeah, so Nathan Aspinall's in the World Championship Darts PDCs. I'm not really into yeah, darts no, myself. Yeah, right. no, he's, uh, funny enough, I got the photographer down because Motti rang me in a desperate, oh, I need a photographer, I need a photographer. So I got one of the non-league lads to turn up. And, and I believe every time Nathan Aspinall hits a 180, uh, £100 worth of vouchers for the playing entrance gets given to a school in Southport. Right. So nice. That's, that's going to be well, a anyway. yeah, yeah. Isn't it? It yeah. Is. Well, yeah, it is. And I think his first match is tomorrow night. Oh, is it? Great. Yeah. yeah. Um, just sorry, back to Covent Garden. They have a connection with the Wellspring as well. So if you go in there and put an extra quid in a pot, I think they um, buy a, they create a sandwich and hand it off to the Wellspring. Um, so more connections with so the Wellspring just, there. So just uh, Wellspring is the homeless support centre in Stockport. Very, very, yes. very, very, very good thing. Yeah. Um, Back to the player's entrance. Done it a bit arse about face, but who cares? Uh, if you show your Eventbrite ticket or your match ticket or your season ticket on Saturday morning before the match, you get a free go of one of their uh, of one of their simulators. Cool. So that's pretty good. Um, and then finally, the Royal Oak. I've got nothing to say about the Royal Oak apart from going there because they're a sponsor. And you'll see all our posters up on the and wall. They've got loads of tellies, apparently. And they've got loads of tellies. <laughs> yeah. um, and my mum's trying to do trying to create a county corner where the pool table is we should oh. say that his mum's the landlady she's not just going into a <laughs> yeah yeah my mum's the landlady yeah <laughs> gradually creating a county <laughs> what's that woman doing <laughs> <laughs> she's got her ironing board set up and everything um so um that's a bit sexy, sexy. Wasn't it? Yeah, yeah it was a bit yeah i'm, 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 I'm not even gonna cut that out actually <laughs> <laughs> can we disassociate ourselves from yeah, i know yeah from mr brennan's <laughs> sexist comments well i do the ironing in my house so it's not real well, and yeah, i do it in mine as well i do in my well i do i do it as when and as i need can withdraw that sex yeah Makes a change for a woman to bloody eye. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so back into Dark Days then. I think we ended the last Dark Days part three at the end of the 2011-2012 season, but there was a couple of things that we forgot, and I'll start on a thing that I forgot to mention, and then and then so you can you can follow on from that, whatever you guys have forgotten. So just before that season ended, or well, no, in the November actually, I was approached by a, f- um, a then friend of mine to. to organize a charity cycle and people people might remember this uh, you may or may not remember this but we organized a county charity cycle uh, in in collaboration with st anne's hospice oh yeah Yeah. um because my you had you had your connections with st anne's hospice well my gran um worked there for 28 years really yeah and my granddad passed away there right um so that was that was my connection to that so we got the charity involved and everything and it was it went off really successfully, and I did that um, with, with a chap who was on the co-op board at the time. 
Uh, so we raised, I think we raised fourteen thousand pounds for a split between St Anne's Hospice and the County Trust, right? Or the County Co-op. I'm yeah. not sure if it's the Trust or the Co-op at the time. I think it was the Co-op, co-op. at the time. Uh, so that was like my in with the Co-op. So fast forward uh, to probably I don't know January or February the following year. So 2012, January, February 2012. I was invited to a meeting, uh, the co-op board meeting, by by this this friend, um, just to see if I wanted to get involved, see what it was like, see if I wanted to, you know, get involved with the club because I'd already been involved in. Do you remember the um, be your own Abramovich handing out the bar, uh, the bar, um, what are they called? Beer mats. Beer mats. That's it. Beer mats. Too low to the, the bar. Circle no, thing. I have no idea what you're talking about. Do you remember that? I don't actually. Was it? Did you make any money out of it? No one made. Didn't hand it over it. to the club. No, no. I don't. I, don't, <laughs> I think it was the truck. I don't know who it was at the time, yeah. but I remember. I just do remember the beer match, but I thought they were um, our town, our team, or something like that. I'm not sure. It was be your own a brand, but Sonny was involved. You know, George Hudson at the time. So, so anyway, I, I did. I did a bit of that. So I knew people there anyway. So I thought I'll get. I'll get involved a bit more. I've always been a member and stuff like that. So. Um, I think so. you just dreamt that bit. No, no, I didn't. I know. <laughs> Honestly, I, I wish I'd kept one now. Um, it was around the time that I bought Bonds as well, I think. So I think we spoke about that before. No. Okay. That's, that's a proper dad joke. I know. Well, I'm, um, I'm, I'm even a granddad. So <laughs> I think that's what you're thinking, to be honest. The Bonds thing, I think it was with the trust, wasn't it? Yeah. When the trust first took over, that was part of their marketing, I think. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, yeah. That's Dave Espy yeah. for anybody who's listening. Because he doesn't <laughs> speak very often. So. <laughs> But yeah, be Not part of be, be an owner of your own, of your club, yeah. and and yeah. it was like I had a picture of Abramovich on one side. I remember going around all. I, I remember it now. Actually, oh, you said that no, you're okay. just being polite. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what's I don't about. remember. <laughs> you just want to move on, don't you? There'll be loads of county fans. Like There'll be loads of county fans. Like so so yeah. So jo- went to that meeting. There was it was like I don't know about twelve people sat around this table, all of, you know board members of the, of the, of the county co-op. Uh, so I thought great, and then then. Fast forward again to the end of the season where we sort of left it last time. Um, and it was a week after we beat Hayes and Yedding. Uh, I was invited to another meeting. And that was then, I didn't know it at the time, but joined, when I turned up for this meeting in the co-op, at the top of the co-op building in, in, in the pyramid, uh, all the board are there and Jim Gannon sat there. Um, the so board he, being the co-op board? Not, not the, the co-op yeah, sorry, the co-op yeah. board. Yeah, we were all sat there and Jim Gannon sat there and went through a few things and all the usual faces that you probably know off yellow board and things, that, you know, sat there. Um and it was all a bit, it was all a bit hot air, if I'm, if I'm being honest, from my perspective. The, the the thing that I did take away from it actually was Jim Gannon. His his priority was making the match day experience for the kids much much better than it was. Good. And he had a, he had an organisation plan and you know a, a bit of a bit of a, a lightweight business plan I'd say for the club and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, he, he impressed me quite a bit. And then for, I don't know what I don't know what happened generally after that, but I went to another meeting, probably four or five weeks after that and the numbers had halved at the, at the co-op board so the people had started dropping off and saying I'm resigning I can't do this anymore so treasurer left uh, c- communications person left all this sort of stuff um, and you'd have thought you'd have passed that on wouldn't you <laughs> who the communications, communications guy. yeah you thought so wouldn't you yeah. <laughs> um, so it started to dwindle and as we go through this next season as we start to talk about it I can start to chip in with meetings with Pointy shoed people, um, <laughs> as people look at what they've got on the footwear, um, and and other fundraisers and things like that, and and, and how the co-op board dwindled to its uh, to a very very low ebb and low you know low numbers, and then kind of grew again. So I, I can certainly, uh, and it's quite an interesting story as I chip in. Just on that point, it's interesting because obviously when the trust lost control of the club, which would be a couple of years before this, it, it just like it just went. And the court was almost, I think did, uh, like one or two people literally kept the fans, uh, the official fans organisation as recognised by Supporters Direct ticking over. Yeah, so that was that was me, Mary McGee Wood and Mike Davis. Right, so that, is, is this the time you're talking about? That th- yeah, well, no, no, that, that was before, but yeah. the, at so the, the obviously point came I'm up talking about... And then about went, back, went back down a couple of years later, which is interesting, because yes. I thought it was a steady rise to where we are now, but... There's clearly a dip in the middle. There, yeah. So w- so when I was there and, and and people started dropping off and resigning at an alarming rate, there was only me, Mary McGee Wood, and Mike Davis there. And then we had a chap called Callum, who was surname I forget, but quite a quite a trendy lad, trendy young lad, and he was he was good at um, sort of the digital side. So he he helped us a bit. But there was only three of us, and 
we had all still all the legal things in place to mm. to have you know be a be a supporters co-op the structure the structure yeah. of it yeah. we had all the paperwork we had we still had a good um i think we still had 500 members yeah um but yeah the, the, the board just fell away i think it's, it's interesting i mean i think you three guys and also it may have been graham privet although i might be yeah kept, graham privet kept kept, yeah. kept it taking over from the the, 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 yeah, the so debacler of, of the the trust when that just lost control that'd be of the, club. About the time and when they were taking over so going yeah. back a couple of years ago yeah so graham privet was one of the ones that stepped away as i yeah. as i started right, to, to yeah. join i don't know well, not saying they stepped away because i joined but no, you know no. what i mean but I think I think those kind of people should be given, you know, yeah, credit and, yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. and yeah. you know just just noted that, that they those without those people keeping it ticking over, we probably wouldn't have a trust now. And like Dave said, the trust has got all the legal infrastructure in place and is the recognised supporters direct yeah. body. If county ever did go tits up, the trust would be the one starting the fingers. I, I went so to uh, an important. AGM when it, when the days when it was, I think it was. I mean. It was an AGM. There was about seven people there. Yeah, so I was there. I was there. I was on top of the blossoms, above the blossoms, wasn't it? No, I don't mean that one. I mean, oh. I mean, uh, prior to the prior, prior to that, to, prior oh, okay. to the takeover. Yeah, and, and it was it was it was unbelievable. You know, it was like the the sort of resilience that those people had shown to keep persevering and keep it going when it was grim. And like you say, I think we all uh, we we had something later on to sort of get our teeth into. Yeah. That should it should it ever go tits up again? Yeah. Then the trust is is there. Isn't it's, it? it's, fu- <coughs> it's funny. There's there's lots that happened in between what what I'm about to say, and I don't really remember when it happened. But I'm sure you were there, Dave. And um, there was some sort of meeting. I'm not sure if it was in the bungalow. Um, in fact, it might have been in the bungalow actually, um, with with the the co-op as it was then. And um, and I was there, and and a few was few of us that were sort of ticking the ticking the co-op over at the time. Not sure if the supporters trust or the supporters club or something. I remember. I'm not sure if it was you that said it. You know, we need to all come together. Yeah, it was me. Yeah. Um, you know, have we got any? Have we got any sort of ex- organisation that can? Um, you know, has got the legal framework. And, and I think Mary McGee would went. Well, that's us. Yeah, I was sat on the table with you. Right. Yeah. So, and, and do you know what I mean? And it, I think there's a realisation then that well, let's use the let's use the co-op. You yeah. know, and then that's how it. That's sort always of been grew a again. Though, hasn't it? What's that sort of for a. a how many supporters clubs we have? Well, I mean, it was about seven at one point. Mm. It's ridiculous, you know. And for a, for a, a club of our size, you can, okay, I can understand the help the Hatter, yeah, uh, sort of well, franchise. That's not, if really, you like. that's not really support. Exactly, it's, it's you a know, fundraising. It's, part. Exactly, and then you can understand there being like a supporters trust co-op club, whatever it happens to be. But having lots of different groups like that, it was bonkers. Yeah. Because you need people to pull together. It's like something outside. out of life of Brian, wasn't it? <laughs> it was, yeah, it was, yeah. Um, so as part of that as well, and I, I, again, I'll say it now because I can't remember when it happened, but I went to, I went on a course with the, with the supporters, uh, what are they called? Co-op. The main body. Of Co-op. Supporters Direct. Supporters Direct. Yeah, oh, I went on yeah, a course yeah. with Supporters Direct to, to, to learn how to, I mean, it was child's play really, but you know, it was, it was just like taking you through the motions and Wrexham were there. Uh, Berry were there, um, Blackpool were there, who we, we we laughed at at the time because they were second in the championship, <laughs> just come down from the Premier League, and they sat there complaining that the Oysters were ruining the club. Of course, we didn't know what was about to happen, and well, we did. but they but well they they <laughs> they they obviously saw it. So, um, so yeah, so there's all that going on as well as well as everything on the pitch. So I remember going to meetings with Mary McGee Wood and Mike Davis in Mike Davis's house on Edgeley, and it was just us three. And we're going, what are we going to do next? Mm-hmm. You know, who's going to look after the um, the membership? And I'm going, well, yeah, I can do it. I can, you know, I'm, 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 you know, I'm good with spreadsheets. I can, I can certainly, you know, transform some data and send stuff out. I'm not bothered, you know. And then it started to grow after that. So we'll we'll come to that as we uh, as we move through this. So there we go. And so that was at the end of the 2012 season, when we'd finished that last part. Th- well, we did part mm-hmm. three. And obviously you're looking and reading re- responses on Twitter and somebody actually tagged me in it and said, "Are you? am I dreaming or was there a documentary being filmed? <laughs> because I remembered being interviewed at a couple of games and I was like, oh, how did I forget the documentary? <laughs> and I forgot the documentary because you forget you're being filmed. I said to you, didn't I, Dave? Yeah. We were talking about it. Big brother, isn't it? Basically, uh, one of the things that came with Tony Evans was a little Scouse film crew. And we weren't told it was going to happen, although I, I vaguely remember signing a disclaimer, as you do. Well, you being a media manager, it'd be fuck all to do with you, yeah. wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> they just came. One day there was these student types going around filming and that. And they'd been filming for a few days, 
in and around. And I genuinely thought it was to do with Diddy being here and it was a little thing about Diddy. So I never really questioned it because, again, like I, said, I, want, I suppose it was my job, but it wasn't because they were independent. And then I remember coming in the office one day and they were filming. And me, <coughs> Rob, Claire, Gracie and Jack and that were like, what are you doing? Oh, you need to sign this piece of paper here, blah, blah, blah. We're, we're, gonna, we're, we're doing a behind-the-scenes documentary, fly-on-the-wall documentary. And I remember like, Tony Whiteside slamming his door shut because <laughs> Tony was proper dotting I's and crossing T's. I told you about the, the story about him. Sean McConville brought his driver in. Yeah, yeah. He, he didn't like anything unless it was prim and proper. And as, as far as Tony was concerned, he hadn't been told about it. He wasn't signing a, a waiver. It wasn't happening. So we were getting on with it. So there was a couple of little things that happened during that period. Well, you know, the two things that really stuck out were myself and Rob Clare, uh, and contrary to the fact that somebody put on yellow board that um, one of us was taken in by Tony Evans, nobody was taken in by him. We just had to go with it because he was the new chairman sort yeah. of thing. But so one day he said to me and Rob, right, we're going up to the training ground, we're going to do this, that. and So we went for a meeting up at the training ground and, of course, they were filming us. And... We were watching what we were saying and doing the right thing and doing that. And then the, we come back to the ground and at the end, we get back to the ground and uh, Tony Evans says to us, right, we need a, a recap in the office. So me and Rob go in there and he sits behind the desk and we're having a recap and without even thinking about it, these two lads have followed us in and they're filming us and we forget there. And... It's a good job, really, that that film was never seen. Because I remember now <laughs> that what me and Rob were actually talking about, and it, I'm not going to repeat on here because there were too many people. Because to, Tony, Tony didn't get on with anybody at the club. It, well, former board members and people like that. So he was teeing us up. And what do you think about this, that, and the other? And we go, ah, oh, yeah, well, that could change. That could definitely change. And he, he was good at it, to be fair. He, you know, But he, he was having a go at people who'd sort of stepped away from their responsibilities and this, that and the other. And then, of course, we were like, yeah, well, you're right, Tony. So, and then turned around and there's these two fellas videoing away. And <laughs> I looked at Rob and I was going, oh, my God, you know, we've just dropped ourselves right, in it? But the, the other one, that, I mean, that, the funnier one was we were due to play Link, Luton and they wanted to put it on Sky, it would have been back then, and they wanted to play it. On, on Sky, so it couldn't have been Saturday at three o'clock because that's the rules. Well, it was then. I don't know, seems to be, <laughs> seems to play whenever you want now. And they were filming it, and they brought Tony Whiteside in because he's the club secretary and he plays part in this, that, and the other. And as I'm walking out of the room, I hear Tony Whiteside say to Tony Evans, "I've agreed with Luton that we'll play it on a Sunday afternoon." So I turned around and said, "Sorry." They said, yeah, we're going to play the game on Sunday afternoon. And I said, is there any particular reason for that, Tony? And they said, well, it suits us all. I said, you mean it suits Luton? So he said, what do you mean by that? I said, well, they can come up, can't they, on the Saturday night, stay over, have a nice bit of breakfast, have a nice little wander around, and then play us at dinner time. I said, no, no, Friday night. Play it on Friday night. So Tony Whiteside immediately knows how much work goes into getting the game on Friday night. No, nope, I've agreed it with Luton. I've already agreed it with Luton. It's going to be Sunday. And Tony Evans, to give him a bit of credit, says, what did you just say? I said, Friday night is county night. I fucking love that. I love that. <laughs> Tony, ring Luton up and tell him it's fucking Friday night. <laughs> it's like, it's Tony, no, 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 I've agreed. And Tony Evans is going, mental. Like, no. I, that's got a ring to it. That. Really? <laughs> it like, it's got a ring to it. Fr Tony, listen to me. Friday night is county night. Phil, you're just right. come up with that phrase. No, <laughs> just, and I'm just sat there going, yeah. Go, go, go. go. <laughs> so, anyway, and the thing was, apart from it being Friday night is county night, it made much more sense all the way round. I mean, they were flying as well. They were doing really well at the time, and we were the flying. They were flying up. Yeah, they might have done. Um, but we'll be sponsored by yeah, some fly bee, wasn't yeah. it? <laughs> but um, with it being a Friday night, I knew we'd get a better crowd anyway, and I thought we'd get a better performance, which we did eventually. It was one all, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, McConville scored right yeah, at the yeah, death. Right didn't the death. Yeah, yeah. We played it on a Friday. We got a three and a half thousand crowd. It was a good. It was a decent enough game, and we got a point out of it, which we weren't expecting at the time. I remember grabbing Barry Grabbin, uh, Barry Grabbin, <laughs> Gary Brabin. Even <laughs> it was. We were interviewing him afterwards, and he looked up at the Cheadle end, and I've known Gary since he was quite a young fella. I was going to say small, he's never been small. <laughs> and I seen him looking at the cheese lender. I went, right, Brabs, he went, 
I said, that should be called the Gary Brabbing stand, that. <laughs> so, so, how do you make that out? He went, <laughs> well, you know when Danny Bagar was trying to get rid of me and he had me training with all the kids and they cu he couldn't get rid of me. He said, he had me digging the footings of that fucking stand <laughs> there. He said, I did all, I did barras, barra and barra and barra full of shit out of that stand. That stand should be called the Gary Brabbing stand. <laughs> and I, was, we just, John, I remember John Kieran pissing himself laughing and he turned to me and he went, and don't think, I don't know, it was you that got the game switched from Sunday to Friday. <laughs> but it, it, those things, you, they're on film and you just don't realise you're being filmed. And that bit, I wouldn't, wouldn't mind watching. I don't think I'd want to watch the other bit back. Cause I'm, so, so where is this documentary? I've absolutely no idea. I, I have put a call into somebody that I think might know where right. it is, but he's just not returned me call just yet. Mm. But I do, I think I know that somebody might have a copy. If I get it, We'll get, you it, get it, we'll get edit it, it down, and let's have a charity screen to raise some money. I don't know, edit it down. <laughs> we'll just play it in full. Put it no, out we'll, we'll, we'll overdub it. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, there'll be lots of bleeps. The, um, so, yeah, that was about the only other thing that we, I'd forgotten I mean, in that season. Um, during the season, towards the end of the season, I got approached. Well, I knew somebody who, was, who worked for Hattrick, the comedy people, Channel 4, and he'd let it slip. That they were talking, it was, it was a sh he said that the, the what do they call them? Go around looking at the area to find the right area. Location scope. Location, yeah. the Best location the team, yeah. So, the location team were, had just got back to him. They, they got this uh, football sitcom going on, and they're going to film they, they think they're going to film it. And Berry, and I said, Well, you're from Stockport. And he said, Yeah, I am. So, well, what do you want to film it at Bleeding Berry for? What's Berry got to offer that we haven't got? And he said, Well, you know, I said, Look, Film it here. You've got all the back streets. You've got all the cobble streets. You can have the. You can use the ground. You can use the club shop. You can do anything you want, as long as you film it at Stockport. I said. Plus, I've got hundreds of old shirts. I said that the the cast can choose their own shirt from because if you if it's about football fans, they don't all wear the same shirt. No, they all wear different shirts, and I've got hundreds of them, and they can just anyway. I'll get on to it anyway. We got the job. So basically, they filmed Great Night Out at County. And were you in the starting credits? Your lad was, wasn't no, he? No, it was my lad, yeah. Did, was yeah. it? I sent yeah. you the photograph. You did, yeah. So we did. Yeah. So we had a select few. We put a little thing out where they said, you know, you can be in the opening credits. And so they filmed it on the back of, um, what, what was the street called? Um, I'm not sure the street. It's the one directly perpendicular to the it, It's where the park, builder's yard used to be at the end. Perpendicular. They filmed them coming parts. out as though yeah. they were actually in the ground. Yeah. There's no way out yeah. of the ground from there. Well, it used to be the builder's <laughs> yard, didn't it? You start talking about hardwood in a minute. <laughs> so, so basically the film in it and the whole idea was we were all coming out of the Edgeley Park after a defeat to our rivals Barney, Barney right? <laughs> but you know it's a derby it, isn't it yeah. so basically the, the, so we're coming out and, and we were all in a, a set procedure so and I, I think me and my son and his then girlfriend we were sort of second or third in the row and the joke the opening joke was we got to a corner and there were some Barnet fans walking across the edge of the street giving our lot a load of abuse as though they were our local rivals <laughs> and as though they'd just run us all over Edgeley. So the joke was getting thinner and thinner for us. And it was filmed in summer, wasn't it? It was a yeah. really hot summer and everyone, day. Everyone it was clearly about in July. So <laughs> um, unfortunately for, for the film productions team, they've put Ian Lancashire as the first person at the front, who will be the first person that will walk past these Barnet fans just as they start giving us abuse. So they're filming it, and we get there, and these Barnet fans come out, and the four lads who were in the show, uh, they, they're just in front of... Bar they're just in front. You know, and as they come out, they start giving this dog dog's abuse in Cockney style and Lanks goes fuck off <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that <laughs> he just starts going and it cuts cuts <laughs> and he goes he went it's not real though is it because the Barnet they've never run us <laughs> so the they, no no what, yours is a non-talking part <laughs> so what you've got to do is all get back in your positions and we'll all start again and please <laughs> Don't engage. <laughs> so they do it again. And he manages to get past them. And then turns and goes, fuck off. <laughs> he, just, he starts abusing them all again. So cut, cut. <laughs> right. 
And I, I think he did it three times. He just certainly did it twice. And then he eventually they moved him. And he said, right, I'm sorry, but you can't be at the front of the queue because you quite clearly can't bite your tongue. And he's like, no, but what you have to understand is they're Barnet. Those four lads that are there is about the most they've ever brought. Here. They couldn't have run anything. And he's like, and... We never get beat 4 1 at home by Barnet. And this block's going, yeah, you might be right on all that. It's a TV program. <laughs> but it's not, suspensions of yeah, disbelief. It's in the script that you've lost and you've been run. So you go to the back. <laughs> so, so we all moved up a bit. So that, but it, that, and that was like, I think that was in May, I think. I think we you filmed had the last it last though, didn't you, Lanks? Yeah. Because it was the last one. <laughs> well, I didn't get another series. Yeah, though, but he it? didn't. It yeah. wasn't because of him. And I, 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 know, so, yeah. I know why I didn't get yeah. another. But I don't want to get another solicitor's letter, so I won't tell you why. I didn't another get solicitor's letter? <laughs> <Well, laughs> there's still be a few along the way. Right, okay. But yeah, so it, the, the disappointing. Did, did, did a cast member do yes, extremely a, well? Yes, a cast member. And move on to. No, a cast pre- member. Pre- pre- perhaps a uh, higher profile show. A cast member. What, line of duty? No. no, 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 it couldn't be, it couldn't be that. Couldn't oh, okay. Be. No, it couldn't <laughs> be that. No, it wasn't just about moving on. <laughs> was, it was that like enough? Was refu- that enough? Though? refused to play a part, and if you look, watch it, you can actually see that. He disappeared. That, that, oh, he, I didn't say he. A cast member, yeah, it, it was a he, because there yeah. only four blokes, anyone. And, and that line of duty was a really good show, wasn't it? Was, it? Oh, yeah, <laughs> really fantastic. So, yeah, yeah, so basically, the others, the whole thing fell apart because right. of that one cast member, and just. The, the shame of it was, is whether people like the show or not, it actually did have another series ready to go. Really, yeah. yeah. But ah, fucking like but I've still got, yeah. <laughs> so I've still got the slippers and I've still got Danny O'Donnell. But, um, the, yeah, it actually became, and I mean, the, while they were filming, it was such good fun, you know, and, it, and they were in and out of the club. And for me, I was just pleased that Berry didn't get it, you know. But so that was, that, that was sort of in the summer. Dark days, dark. I'll say. Never seen this. Gee, them days were dark, weren't they? Dark, dark. They were dark, them days. They were dark, all right. I've never seen days so dark. Some of the darkest days ever they were. Yeah, they were right fucking dark. So I suppose we should really talk about football. Yeah, we should. Let's yeah. go on to the football. <laughs> well, the real football. Well, we say that. <laughs> Do you want to know the retained list of players? I've got yeah. that. I've written that down because I'm a bit of a geek like that. So the, the retained list was Danny Whitehead, Danny Attersley, Danny O'Donnell, Joe Connor, Andy Halls, John Nolan, Cameron Dartwa, Carl Pierre Gianni, who didn't stay because he eventually couldn't agree terms. But he couldn't agree terms because we signed James Tunnicliffe, who was really going to take his place so yeah. he, he but went. didn't Pierre Gianni go off and do a gap year or something no no that was l- long after that oh was it he okay. actually went it all mingles into one when you get older yeah he <laughs> I think his next club was Corby Town oh right you know, that's a deal, something bloody hell such got, a player got yeah, in the team is, of the yeah. year yeah. in Corby and then he went to Boston got team of the year <clears> twice <throat> went to Australia then went to Salford right but yeah so I mean he's he, it was our loss at the time yeah yeah but, yeah I think yeah. he's the best centre half we've years. had well, we've been in, well, you know, in yeah, summer. many many losses. Um, <laughs> and Ian Ormson, who'd been offered his first full time contract, Ryan Fraun was one out. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh Jordan Rose was released again. Danny Rowe, little Danny Rowe, yeah, yeah. Had gone. He's doing well, isn't he? Or and he, Boonab. Oh, Boonab, <laughs> Boonab had oh, gone. Oh, Boonab, one for the Boonab yeah. fans. He always gets my vote. Well, uh, we, have, we have a. I don't know if you've listened to the podcast, but we have a scale. Of, when we rate players, it's from Boone up to Francis. Oh, is that right? Where would you rate that player? <laughs> well, so anyway, he'd been released, and and coming in was Sean Newton on a full because he'd been on long cracky player. Yeah, Alex Kenyon on a full. Yeah, very good player. Yeah. Craig Hobson who done decent, done well against us. Yeah, and to be fair, I never thought we used him properly because right. he's you know it was a good centre forward. Yeah, uh, Tom Collins who we stole off Hayes and Yedin. <coughs> on the pitch when we played him in the last game of the season. <laughs> what? What do you mean? What like kidnapped him? Yeah, what do you mean? Put him in yeah, the bus yeah. and brought oh, him back. Bloody hell! No, <laughs> and uh, Tunney and Sam Sheridan came in. Tunney, yeah, Tunney James Tunney Clifford. Just I, I thought Sam Sheridan. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I was say you, you said him twice. That's yeah. all. No, we'll was he that we, good? Yeah. Oh. No. <laughs> no, he was shit. Hey. <laughs> no. So, <laughs> no. We we'll come to that bit. As a young, as a young kid, when he went to Liverpool, he was very good. Yeah, he really was. But we also gave contracts out to several youth team players. So on the football side of things, so 
we played a pre-season friendly night friendly at Cheadle Town, and if you remember, it was the worst weather we'd had for months and months. It was summer, and we played it in biblical conditions. I've never seen rain like it. Chris Davis normally would tell you, "I'm not playing a game," but obviously he wasn't going to turn down whatever it was, 1,800 county fans yeah. drinking his bar dry because there was a bit of rain. But there's a great photograph that Petchy took of, I think it's Andy Alls and Craig Hobson going into a tackle with a Oh, player. yeah, it's a fancy it's spray. It's like, like, it's like the old it Tom is. Finney photograph. You're right in front of the yeah. dugout, wasn't it? So that's how bad the rain was. Uh, and we won 8-0 at a canter. The reason I, I just wanted to add a little addendum to that, the that was on the Friday night. On the Sunday, we were having our, a charity match. We used to play for uh, raise money for one of our lads had got killed on a holiday, and we this was we played it at Woodley the year before. But this was the first eleven aside. I think tournament. I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was at Cheadle Town, and I was thinking, oh my god, we're never going to get this game on. And the difference was unbelievable. It was cracking the flags, and we had a fantastic turnout. Near enough as many turned out for our charity right. game as I'd turned out on a Friday night. Uh, I remember they ran out of beer about three times and Chris Davis and my lad and somebody else had driven to, to you know, a shop where Nick used to work. <laughs> there was a little off-licence there. Yeah, yeah. Kept going back yeah. and filling up the bar. Um, we The reason I think I we think, had such think, a good turnout... Phil Mealy goes in there quite a lot, does he not? Yeah, I think the one of the reasons we had such a good turnout, we had Danny Miller agree to bring his Once Upon a Smile team and Kelvin Fletcher, funnily enough, who's just won the dancing. He, he, he turned up in a a brand new Ferrari or something. Um, and he brought a good side with him. So we played a little knockout, and then the final was Danny's team against our local pub team, who kicked him off the park and beat him because <laughs> there was no friendly there. They wanted to win it. Uh, but the interesting thing from, from a county point of view was we didn't have officials because they'd cried off because they thought the game was going to play. So Alex Kenyon and our new signing, Tom Collins, ran the lines in full gear full um, we borrowed it off can't remember we borrowed it off we borrowed it off a, a Stockport referee anyway, and Rob Clare sorted it out for us because obviously he was a referee yeah. at the time so we had Danny, Alex Kenyon doing the line Tom Collins doing the line and Danny Attersley refed and they ref, they did it all day for nothing Right. all, all they got was a, a, a butty and a, and a drink and that and <laughs> And you imagine it was baking hot, and I think we played about eight games all day. And it, but they did it, and it was considering, well, all three of them really new to the club as well. Yeah, yeah, I mean, good. Attersley had sort of been sort of in and around, and, and we knew Kenyon because he'd been playing for Al's team anyway. But yeah, they, they, they just turned up and did it, and we had a great turnout. But that's it, sounds, I mean, it sounds like um, a speck of light in the Dark Days uh, series that because it sounds quite positive does, yeah. well, about everything doesn't it it's about to go wrong now no, no. well that's what I mean now no, the Dark Clouds are going to come over again aren't they I was just really carrying on from your bit about like Jim was looking at you know bringing back yeah, this, yeah, and yeah. so he'd brought players in that were quite happy to you know jump in I mean after the event they probably would have said that we would have only done one game but they did all day and it was a great day Um, I think if you remember, I'd said about it wasn't really first choice, Jim. I think I'm going to leave it at that. Well, <laughs> I think it's fair to say there was a lot of people at the club who didn't want him anywhere fucking yeah. near the football. So, and I, some of those people are still fucking yeah. near. And it, you know that is the reality. Well, you know. the thing is, we started off, we beat Alfreton and Grimsby, who both spanked I us. I think we just missed a little bit of something out there. He had to get the the wage bill down. Oh yeah, okay. to four hundred and twenty five thousand pounds. And P, yeah, you're right. And then he was told to reduce it again, uh, it, uh, like later yeah, on in well the that, season. season yeah. So he he brought in mostly young kids. I mean, yeah. most of those players I just listed, you know, they're not. I think Tony was the oldest player. Yeah, and I know. think he was on decent money, wasn't he? And uh, so the first sort of month or so of the season. I've written it down. August and September, we played 12 games and we only won three. So we drew six, lost, but we only lost three. Excuse me, but people who are looking for negatives to get rid of a manager will say he's only won three. But actually, we only lost three out of 12, yeah. which is quite a good stat, really. Yeah. <laughs> but um, And and he's about half the budget, the playing budget. Yeah. So... By the end of November, we'd played 18 games and those stats have deteriorated slightly. So we've gone six wins, six draws, six losses. So 
again, it's still one of the last six out of 18. But well, it's, if middle looking, of the, it's middle of the middle of the table, isn't it? So there was already some rumblings. And it was around that time, and I can't put a, a specific point on it, but it was around this time that Spencer, who was heavily involved at the time, had met, don't know when he'd met him, but he suddenly introduced Ryan McKnight to the club. <laughs> I can hear you all booing in the background. <laughs> I think you need music still there. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, he suddenly started turning up at games as a guest of the club. And he would be sat with Ryan and Lord Snape, who, as we know, wasn't Jim's biggest fan anyway. So, he attended at least the next eight games. He might have attended games before that, but the first time I spotted him, I think it was none eating away, uh, and then he was at every game. Can I ask you, Phil? Because I, I, I remember Jim said he wanted either a centre half or a right back, and he was told by the club he could have. So let's say he wanted a centre half, he was told by the club, no, the problems at right back. There was something I, I know that at the none eating game, we'd brought. Connor in, Connor Jennings, right. who destroyed us he's, the year before. He's a fantastic yeah. player. But he'd gone from Staley Bridge to Scunny. Right. He'd had a jump, he'd had a yeah. proper move. But he was struggling at Scunny, injuries, whatever. And we could get him on loan. And I don't think we paid his wages, right. which was why we got him. Yeah. And if we paid some, we didn't pay anything like what he yeah. was on. So that was his debut. And I'm fairly sure that in the first 10, 20 seconds, he hits the bar. If that goes in, we win that game because we were, you know, we got Connor Jennings and everyone was buzzing about it. And it, he hits the bar, it goes over the bar, and eventually we lost the game 2 0, I think 2 1. I think Sean Newton might have scored a pen. But anyway, we lost the game and all that. But that was like the beginning of the end, really, because yeah. that's the first game that Ryan's at. It's the first game we've all spotted him. Everyone's going, because let's be honest, you, you couldn't miss him. You, you know, he, he did dress stranger than us. He wasn't a northerner, <laughs> is what I'm saying. <laughs> 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 so anyway Wait, you dress smartly no I, well <laughs> no, you, I know, I know you, you might mean. think that's smart you know anyway <laughs> he had his own style it was he had his, his own style yeah. it was more his crash helmet hairstyle that would kill me <laughs> he, he looked like a twat <laughs> wrong <laughs> so anyway um, I don't think he's changed his look I saw him um, I saw him on, on LinkedIn doing some sort of agency just, seminar well, no, thing he and he's, he's, got the, he's got the same haircut Slightly and, slightly the thin. and the same bullshit. Probably, yeah. 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 Anyway, the stats for those next eight games for Jim. 1-1, one, one, drew one, lost six. Mm -hmm. And you're quite right. At the time, there was all this talk about, I want this, I need this player, I need that player, I need another player. And, it, and they were, well, you can have one or the other or well, whatever. But I, I, you can't I, have that one. But I remember, I remember him saying, you can have this player. And yeah. he's like, well, I don't need that player. I want a player in this yeah, position. Yeah, there was. I'm trying to think who the player was. There was a particular player that kept getting mentioned. And, it, and it's like, and, hold on a minute. But this guy knows him. more about football than the rest of you put together. Yeah. Why, yeah. You, why is anybody questioning him if he yeah. says, this is what I need? I remember after, a, one, it must have been one of those losses, but I remember after a loss, Listening to Snape on the no, way, I'm just on the way to home. That. I'm just oh, go, on, go on, go on. No, no, no. Well, I'm going to let you. You can say it. No, so no. Basically, it, might be, it might be completely different to no, what you're going to say. You're not. We lost at whoa. Well, we lost at Woking one nil. Yeah. Is that the game? So is that the rant on the radio? I As it's known, I can't remember. Right, well, it's I can't remember. well. I'll tell you. I'll lead you into it. It's Woking away. We were unlucky. Joe Bunny made his debut that day. I think. I think that was the day with Joe Bunny. Oh no, no, no. That was it. Could have been. Could have been that game Joe Bunny made his debut. Anyway, we lost 1-0. I think it was to another late goal and it was a scruffy goal. And when you looks out, you looks yeah. out and you're hitting the post and you're not putting chances away. And John Sainty was there at the game. So we've got Liggins and JK. And I'm sat on JK's shoulder doing my bit now and then, joining in. And next to me is Sainty. And we teed Sainty up. He was going to be the after show. No matter what, he was going to come on and do a bit. And he's, I've turned to say, to say, you're on, I'll, I'll give you a nudge when you're on and we'll swap places. So we swap places. And then I see Luggin, Luggins, Liggins pointing and I look at, and Lord Snape's charging <laughs> up the stand. He's <laughs> like, and, and obviously Liggins is a true professional. He knew what was going to happen long before any of us knew. You know, he knew that, 
Lord Snape was going to come and talk on that radio. Whether or not he was invited, he was talking on that radio. And we're just teed up Sainty, who's in county folklore. Yeah, you know, course, he's one yeah. of our legends, yeah. isn't he? And he's sort of turned towards... I'm doing a turn thing on the radio. So he's turned towards <laughs> Liggins and JK. And Lord Snape pushes past me, sort of as good as man handled Sainty out of the way. I need to talk to you. And just took over the, the show. And he, you say you heard it on the radio. Well, I it? think it's the same one. It was, it, was, it was the point when he said about the manager, because yes. I don't think he mentioned Jim Gannon, but he said the manager liked to tell me how I can run my football club. But he should get back to the you know running the football team on the pitch or something to that effect. I think that's quite succinct. Yeah, it's gone on in infamy. Every fan but who heard it knows what, what it's, he's talking it was, about. And to be fair, the football club was re- being run so phenomenally well at that yeah, time. Well, exactly. Who the fuck was yeah. Jim Gannon to stick his nose in? Yeah, um, I mean basically Jim had, I think again Jim only Jim could sort of tell you that because he was so frustrated that he knew what he needed. He knew he, what he needed. You to know get what you mentioned him. at the start about you know he, he put this kind of mini yeah, business yeah, plan. Yeah, he's an incredibly detailed oh, yeah, guy yeah. and he's very thoughtful. And any kind of presentation that he puts together, he's not doing it out. He's, he might have produced it out of frustration, but he's producing it with good intentions. Yeah, yeah. Like this will help us. This will work. And I think know? he was yeah, getting yeah. cut off at every corner. Every time he came up with a solution, it wasn't happening. And then we're losing games. Yeah, and, yeah. and there was yeah. Pe- there's people in the background who are sniping away, sniping away. Oh, they weren't just sniping, mate. Yeah. They're, um, <laughs> they're sniping. Uh, no, no, no. Oh. Um, there was just, I just need a little bright spot on that. I said bright spot from my point of view. During this period, Rob, who's still at the time the, the uh, commercial manager, we, he was thinking of ways to get, you know, attention diverted away if you like so let's do something that's good for the fans and so we were talking I said well we can have why don't we get with and he said we was going to do a a sportsman's dinner but who do we get that will get the imagination of county fans so I said well I know Mickey Quinn I know him really well I've known him for years he'll do it so Rob said well ring him then so I, I ring, I put a call into Quinny, left a message, rings me back. I said, look, told her what it was about. We're looking at this and, and, you know, it'd be great for you to come back and tell some old stories and this, that, and So we agreed a fee. So I go to Rob to tell him I've agreed a fee with Mickey. And he has already said to Spencer, we've got this great idea. We're going to get Mickey Quinn in. Spencer says to Rob, right, great. I'll get my mate. He knows him. He'll bring him in. So <laughs> Rob says, no, well, Phil knows him. Phil knows him. He's already spoke to him. Go and tell Phil not to talk to him. Leave it to me. I'll sort it out. I'm a good friend with Eric Hall. Eric Hall will bring him in. So he says to me, what do you think? I said, well, he's already agreed to do it, but Eric Hall might be able to get him cheaper. He knows him. You know what I mean? Spencer, next thing I hear, Spencer says to Rob, uh, tell Phil to ring Quinny back and get him on. Apparently, <laughs> Eric Cole's rung, rung Spencer and gone, who the fuck he knows is Phil Brennan then? He, he, apparently, he wanted 1,500 quid, Eric Cole, but I've got him for a grand. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so I don't know where that other 500 quid was going. <laughs> but anyway, so Quinny did it for a grand and it was brilliant. He, he did a great night and those of you that were there will agree. But that was just, these little things were going on during the time. Ta- another thing that we'll come back to, but I'd, at the beginning of the season, I'd, during the summer I'd had a bit of a set to with, with Spencer. By this time, sale have gone. But the big shop stood empty. And we're still in the rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which and, was a disgrace. And, wasn't it? Well, it was always a disgrace. Yeah, we should, should never, never have been in there. Never. But anyway, so I'm always head to head with Spencer about the big shop. We need the big shop. We need the big shop. And we haven't got the staff and all this. Like I said, I'll run it. What do you mean you'll run it? I said, well, I've done sales all my life. I'll do it. I said, I'll move my media room into the back of the shop. Leave it with me. Blah, blah, blah. And continually banging away at him. And eventually he agreed to let me do it. So we had a jamboree, Dave, <laughs> <laughs> to announce the big shot was on. So just, it, I can't remember whether we had the bands on that one. We definitely had bands on the next one, but I think we did have a band. It's, a, band. Matter of, it's a matter of 
pride yeah. in having that. Shop, we did. We have. A, we did have a band because we had a truck, an yeah. open, open back truck, and we had That's a band. Right. We had yeah, a call yeah. the Still, I think. That's, That's Richard stopped. Singleton's band. He was yeah, County Trans. Podcast, wasn't he? Yeah. He was on the podcast. Uh, That's right. Yeah. yeah. Is that when you did? You, did, you say you did the kit launch, didn't you? You, yeah. you had the shutters closed, didn't you? And then you opened them up yeah. and let everybody in. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. Into the big shop. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for remembering that. Yeah. So it was all planned. Yeah. So. So we'd gone we from... We didn't just turn up late yeah, and open no. up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that happened. But. So not on my watch. So basically, we, we'd got the shot back as well. So there was some... There was quite a bit of feel good. And I need to say this now, because when we took the shop on, it was massive. And Compared we, to the rabbit hutch. We had no stock. <laughs> right, so it was all right having this great idea. Of, but I'd gone behind the scenes and I'd spoken to people. We had no suppliers would touch us with a barge pole because of what had gone historically. Nobody would give us much stuff without paying up front. So, um, Steve Cree, everyone knows who Steve Cree is. I go to see Steve. Uh, to be fair, I think Steve came to me. I, I genuinely can't remember me going to Steve. I think Steve came to me and said, look, I can provide polo shirts, sweatshirts, all this sort of thing. I can do all that, but I haven't got any designs. So, me and Liam and a couple of others put our heads together and we said, right, well, we give you the designs. So basically, Steve Cree... So he funded the, sh the shop. He, he funded at least half of the shop. So we got all different uh, tops. In fact, the old CK stock boat came back for it. Yeah, we sold yeah. a few of them. So <laughs> um, so we brought back some old designs that we'd had on the fanzine, which because they were good designs. They sold they were, on the fanzine. Yeah, so yeah. They, they, they infringed copyright, but yeah, they were great designs. So <laughs> we're, we're still being flying. I, I, I'd say that Steve Cree's responsible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so basically, so we did. We we got all without Steve's help. We would not have had a good shop. See, I didn't know that. It's very so, good. That. Um, yeah, I didn't know that. So, and the, the the club weren't too good with Steve later on, and we'll come to that. But so Steve's come to me, and we've got this, and because we've got Steve funding the shop, we've got sweatshirts, polo shirts, we had kids stuff that we'd not had for years with loads of... Lo Everything we did in adult size went all the way down to juniors. And without Steve's help, that wouldn't have happened. And thank you very much for that, yeah, Steve. Totally. It was a brilliant thing to do. But because Steve had done that, I was then able to go to, like, the tie manufacturers and, and people out and say, well, we've got this and we've got... And we was, I was showing them all the stuff on photographs that we got in the shop. And people started to go, well, I'll tell you what we will do then. We'll give you 500 quid credit yeah. and we'll give you a grand credit. Because you could build a bit of credibility. Yeah. And all of us, and we had the sweet guy who turned up with boxes of sweets with Stockport County labels on him. And it's just everything. And he was a county fan and gave them us for nothing. We didn't even have to pay for them. But yeah. I've still got them in the garage. No, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> but no, we had so many people who suddenly thought, hang on, we've got our shop back. You know, and, and it was, and like you say, we lifted the shutters on yeah, the name. Yeah. Everyone was in like, a, you know, like bees. It was magic. Yeah. So we'd got all that in the summer. And we sort of built everything up, and then we the results weren't going good. I mean, to be fair to Jim, the results results weren't bad. But then once Ryan and Spencer and all them lot started to get together, and I don't know what how the meetings went with Jim. I don't know how many times he asked for players. I don't know how many times he was told not. All I know is statistically, from the first game that Ryan appeared on the scene to the day that we lost to Mansfield everything went to shit for Jim and I don't honestly think and on art it was Jim's fault I so, genuinely don't uh, and we've, we've talked to, we've, we've talked and disagreed about whether Paul let me just Simpson finish that one let me just finish well, that one bit when you said about we lost to Woking 1-0 they lost to Hyde 7-0 the week before, the week before. Right. that was what was really hurting people like Snapey yeah we, we've talked about it and we've disagreed we, I think Paul Simpson probably would have kept us up had this to kept him you know in that season Jim Gannon would have kept us up it might have been like hook or crook, you know what I mean? Well, he'd but, done it a season before. Yeah, exactly that, you know. And to, to not have faith in somebody who's proven that they can do the job under tricky circumstances, it's just ridiculous, isn't it? It's just stupid. I mean, the their action plan, as I'm sure we're about to talk about, was fucking nonsensical, wasn't it? It's yeah. like, on the one hand, you've got a manager who's proven, been here, done it, cares, isn't running away... We'll we'll fight to the end to to maintain our, and on the other hand, you've got this fucking nonsensical idea. I think when you look back through Jim's three terms, there's been plenty of occasions where he could have just gone. Do you know what? I'm yeah, off. yeah, yeah. And he's never once done it, and he's never. I don't ever think he's ever 
even got near to thinking that's what I'm going to do. But even after two terms to come back, he could have just said, "Oh fuck that, I'm not going back." So for a yeah, third term, but that, that, on this particular term, uh, you know, I'm going to say I was there. He was forced out of the club, and and if anybody wants to send me a letter, tell me I can't say that. I can, because I saw it. Yeah, I saw what happened. I know what was. I know what's coming up for a start. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, re- and remember, Mr. S- Lord Snape had said he couldn't lose, could he? He couldn't lose. He couldn't lose because he'd given us what we wanted. Yeah. And if he kept us up, he'd given us what we wanted. Yeah. And if we didn't stay up, he'd still given us what we wanted. Yeah. All right, own game coming up. Where are we going? Like, what's your pre match plan? Usually Bobby Peel for me. Peel? What about you, Dave? Well, as we've already established, I'm a Tory, so I'll just bring GT from home and drink it in the back of the car. What about you? I mean, I'm, where are you going? Bobby Peel? Yeah. yeah. How many tellies have we got? Five. <laughs> oh, mate, mate, you're not going to believe this. You want to get onto the Royal Oak. Why? What's the good about the Royal Oak? We've got tellies, we've got big tellies, we've got small tellies, we've got tellies when you're ordering a drink, we've got tellies when you're having a piss, they've got tellies when you're having a stick outside. Tellies, tellies, tellies! Aside from that, it's a really good place to go before the match, and alcohol is also available. But yeah, so as luck or bad luck would have it, our next game was Hyde at home. And of course we lost. Oh, we did, yeah. Griffin played for them, and didn't he? scored directly Poole from a well. corner. Yeah, right. Pool played in for the them as well. Pooley, well, I don't think Pooley made the second goal. Pooley didn't score, but Griff scored. No, but, they, but the, Griff scored from a corner, and Pool played, didn't he? So I always remember Griff taking a corner and just kneeling down in the corner where he took the corner. I thought you need to get away from that corner as quick as you can, lad. But to be fair to him, they didn't gloat. You know, they, you know they been released to come back they've done a job for the yeah, new club yeah. and they were all about staying up Yeah, they weren't like us We they weren't thinking we should be up at the top of the table Gary Lowe had got his team promoted as champions of the Conference North yeah. absolutely phenomenal achievement and you know they were doing and to be fair they did stay up and it wasn't at our expense they stayed pretty yeah, high yeah. up yeah. so of course we lose to Hyde at home on it was one of the Christmas fixtures, <coughs> and uh, I think it may have been Boxing Day. Don't know. I think it might have been Boxing Day. And the word around the club after the game is he's gone. Jim's out. He's, he's just it's not happening. He's not staying. And from memory, Lord Snape was away at his foreign retreat, Spain, Portugal, wherever. And if we didn't beat Telford at home which was the next game, he had to go. And we drew to all. So round the club, inside the club, we were all thinking, well, is he going? What's going? Who's going to sack him? Snapey's away, whatever. And we didn't have a chairman because Snapey was on holiday. And then we won at, <laughs> we won at Hyde and Conor Jennings scored. Um, I think he was back then because I, I don't think we kept him. He'd come back, I think, for a second term. I might have been, might be wrong about that, but I don't think we kept him. I think he came back. Is that on New Year's Day that we? Did? Yeah, yeah, we won one nil. Away at Hyde, yeah. Of course, they didn't sack him. So, I'm led to believe that certain members of the board weren't happy that we'd won, but I can only tell you that's what I was told. I didn't see, I didn't witness it myself, but it was that's whispered <laughs> around the ground that certain people <laughs> weren't happy. Fuck and I'm not saying that was Snapey. I'm saying certain no, no, no. people weren't happy that we'd won the game. How can you? It's just, it's just well because I think if it? you think of it, and not being protective of these people, but if you think of it from their point of view, they've made the decision. Jim's going, so they need him to play ball. They don't want him winning games. Mm. They need him to keep failing. And being Jim, picked the right team, got a result against Telford. Do you think we're losing? So we we didn't lose to Telford. We drew. And we won at Hyde, so we've got four points from two games, and that's really good return when you're up against it. So you're not playing ball, Jim. Can you lose games, please? And that, and, and you know that's 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 football. That's not just county. That's just the way it is. Um, we lost at Cambridge. The next game we got tonked, and we were poor. We got beat four-one. Um, then, on the day, number one, on the day that we played Mansfield at home. Now, this is a strange little story. I need to tell you this. We played Mansfield at home. Now, they're t- they were flying. They weren't top of the league at the time. I think they would go top if they beat us. And we would obviously f- fall further down the table if we lost. So on the day, 
we get a phone call, or Rob Clare gets a phone call. They had a fan on the board. Uh, a real fan on the board, not yeah. somebody who was just there for token <coughs> sake. He yeah. apparently went to meetings and stuff like that. So he's having a chat with Rob, organising their tables and stuff like that. And he says to Rob, strange game tonight, isn't it? Whoever, le- whoever loses, loses the job. And like, Rob says to him, you what? You're top of the table. You're, if you win tonight, you go top. I think it was Paul Cox, was it? The manager of Mansfield who took him up as champions. Paul Cox, I think it is. Um, so, Rob says, well, we're near the bottom. Can understand us if we lose. Yeah, I think he will lose his job because we've just got, we've lost three and four or whatever it is. Three and five. And, um, and we've got this student who's turned up. Yeah, so, he got, <laughs> so this fella says, no, well, apparently he's got 36 first-team players. What? He's got 36 first-team players. He's not talking to 12 of them. He's bought them all. He's actually brought them all to the club. He's not talking to 12 of them. They're training with the 12-year-olds. No, that's probably a bit wrong, 16-year-olds. Yeah. They're training <laughs> with the kids. But of the 24 or whatever it is that are left in the first-team squad... He can't decide which is his best eleven, and he keeps changing them. But he's still at the top end of the league. Well, yeah, but they were top for a long time, and then they started to drop points. Anyway, we get a penalty at nil nil, and Danny Attersley missed it, and then goes up the other end and gives a penalty away, and they score, and they battered us in the end. I think it was three, but anyway, they beat us. So. After the game, our job was still working in the club shop at the time, so he used to t- you know, lock up and everything, come and meet me. By the time our job comes to meet me, I'm with Lordy, and uh, we're told that Jim's been sacked. And there'd been a hastily arranged board meeting, and there was only, from memory, Peter Snape and Spencer there. Funnily enough, earlier on in the day before the game, we'd announced that we've got a brand new chief exec who was due to start at the club in in the 2nd of February, the following month. I think this was halfway through January, and he was due to start in two weeks' time. So he wasn't officially working for the club, but he'd been named. I think, Dave, you've got the thing there, haven't you, yeah. from the BBC? 15th of January, this is Dave. Yeah, so that was the day... Of I think that was the day of the Mansfield game. Certainly, the day or the day before. So he spent. We've announced a chief exec, and we, you know we're up against it. We're bottom end of the <laughs> national league, and we're bringing in a thirty-year-old chief exec, who <laughs> I mean, everyone's seen the videos where he's telling us he's got ten years experience. experience. Uh, well, it, it is the quote. Is the quote. I've only ever wanted to work in football, and although I'm only 30, I've got 10 solid years of working in football behind me. He told BBC Radio Manchester. Right, just hold that because it's at this point I'm going to play the actual clip and you can hear it for yourself. Good man. Bing. Warning the following clip contains corporate bullshit bingo at an obscene nature. Credit only Grey One for the YouTube clip. Delighted to welcome to Edgeley Park, Ryan McKnight, the new Chief Executive of Stockport County. Yeah, well, first of all, great to be here, really. Exciting opportunity for me. Um, really one that I've been searching for for, for for quite a long time. I was really looking for a, a blank canvas to uh, to really implement the philosophies that I've... And I really view County as a, as, as a place where I can not only do that, uh, but also do that effectively. Uh, I think it's got all the foundations to... Uh, to be a, a really good club once again. Uh, clearly, I've been following the club over the past X amount of years for all the wrong reasons. Uh, but with the owners that are in place here now, it's um, uh, that's what's really attracted me, uh, uh, and the uh, the positioning and the culture that we can uh, we can bring success back to the club, both on a playing side and, and more importantly on, on on a business side structurally. So I, th- I think there's a difference between having. Um, say ten years experience in the game like like I have, and having one year's experience ten times, and I think I'm certainly in in the in the former of that. Uh, and from the very 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 outset of of working within the football industry, I've uh, naturally gravitated towards the people that have been um, the most revolutionary in their thinking. It, when it's when you deal with those guys, um, that is where the the extreme best practices and 
naturally gravitated toward those individuals and, and of course that, that, that has led me to, to being Chief Exec of the World Football Academy recently, of course owned by Raymond Verheyen and, and, and Gus Hiddink um, and that's an organisation at the very pinnacle of the performance within, within the game and a real nice compliment to um, the expertise that I grew when I was Editor-in-Chief of FC Business which is of course the very pinnacle of talking about best practice within the business side of the game so I like to think that I've got a sort of 360 degree uh, and the game is littered uh, with um, poor practice, malgovernance mal uh, on, on all levels and look I wouldn't be here if, uh, if I didn't think I was going to be given the environment to, to fully implement the philosophy of um, view, view on the game and I think that's going to put me in good stead for, for what we're going to do here of running a football club and the standard of performance that we want to implement here right across the organisation on the playing and the business side of the organisation in a way of working here that's that's football specific. Uh, it's going to be different to what has been going on in, in, in recent years. Uh, and instead of hoping things are going to work out for the best, actually things are going to work out for the best as a byproduct of the work that we do with, with some more certainty. Uh, and there's so many ways in, in which this club can be can be best practice for me. And, um, and as I say, keep going back to it, it's, it's that environment of being able to operate really with a blank canvas that, that's, that's going to you know, give this club a sort of shot in the arm and um, to really turn the boat around now. You'll be coming in officially from the 1st of February, although I know these things work, you tend to do a lot of work sort of off the books before yeah. you actually come in officially, but yeah. do you have any idea yet what might be the first item when you're in tray? What's the one thing that you may want to have a look at and think, you know, I think I can do something there? Most football clubs operate a sort of short management timeline to manage the short-term goals. Um, we're going to be uh, managing the long-term goals on a, on a, on a short-term basis that the, the club tries to work towards. And of course, you need you need um, uh, my new management on, on a week on a week-to-week -week basis. Of course, you do, but you, they need to be a reflection of what the long-term goal is in recent history about what happens when you when you don't have that fortitude to keep the long-term aspirations um, and, and health of the business. Um, you know. The, the very sense of football, it's, it's the art of managing the science and too many football clubs just inflate the science. So we're going to be raising those expectations okay, look, and, it's, and this is the chicken and egg of, of, of football clubs. Um, of course you have to manage the shorts. Uh, what I don't want to do and what I will refuse to do is get bogged down in this notion that we need to ever focus on uh, the sort of minutia of, of, of things that don't have certainty over them. Um, we're going to be working towards a long-term goal but that, of course, that is not going to be at the expense ever. So, this um, student who turns up for the chief exec's role, the ten solid years of football experience, is on sixty thousand pounds well th that became apparent afterwards on this day obviously we weren't told you can say it a bit louder than that dave <laughs> and on sixty thousand pounds a year mm. for a club that can't afford to buy players to keep us in the division is that what you're leaning towards uh, yeah I, I i am astonished that that they thought he well first of all i'm astonished they thought that he was the answer to anything I'm fairly sure that that figure was actually made public, wasn't it? It's not people aren't guessing. No, we know we know that because he took a twenty percent pay cut, didn't he? Whether he did or he didn't, but he certainly announced that to go down to forty eight thousand pounds. That so, bit, that bit I do know. So is so you know my maths is <laughs> pretty pretty solid there. That's twenty percent yeah. off, yeah, forty eight. But um, forty eight though. What just as a backup, <laughs> again uh, at the time, the next day, and. There were, there were people... 60 fucking thousand pounds! <laughs> <laughs> um, but he had nothing to do with the sacking of Jim because that was one of the questions. I don't start work for two weeks, nothing to do with me. I wasn't at the meeting, I wasn't in the board meeting. I've not and been to the last eight games fucking plotting. I think the next day was the day that Richard Park became a director. Right. It was certainly in and around that time and in fairness to Richard, that he actually did say that if he'd have been in that meeting, yeah. he would have stood up for Jim not getting a sack. Yeah. He did say well, he's that. proved that since, hasn't he? No, but I'm fair, saying so. so at the time yeah, yeah, people yeah, will yeah. say that yeah, I mean you know, I'm not I'm not gonna say I'm Rich's biggest fan, but I'm yeah. you know, what I will say is that at the time he said that if he'd have accepted the directorship beforehand and also they wouldn't let Fitzy in the meeting because Fitzy was a, a board member without power. Right. Right. A non, so a a non speaking part. So there would have been two V two. <laughs> so yeah, two V two. Yeah. 
So Richard Park and Fitzy would have said, no, yeah. you can't sack him. They weren't in the meeting. Yeah, Richard Park certainly wasn't the people yeah. around the club. It, 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 I mean, so, so I, 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 I think it would be unfair to name those people who are at the club now. Don't then. It, it would be unfair. So I'm, I'm not going to. But... <laughs> Well, Steve Bellis. <laughs> no, Steve wasn't at the club. I'm joking, Steve, I'm joking. Steve, definitely. Steve, mate, you weren't at the club. You're coming in a in a joke. Minute. You're coming into the story in a few minutes. So, what I will say, and again, this is a really underhand, what had happened, and I know this to be true because a play, one player at least confirmed it to me, that there'd been. Uh, what's the word when a few people go and meet another people? Other people. A jamboree. No, not a jamboree. <laughs> delegation? Delegation. There'd been a delegation. <laughs> no, a delegation is the word I'm looking for. Um, there'd been a delegation where some players and some people from the club had met and had agreed that whatever happened in the game against Mansfield, there was a letter from players saying they couldn't work with Jim. <sighs> Oh, it's a bit like it's now, a bit like the again, of the Parliament, isn't it? Jesus. I don't have proof of that, but what I do have is the names of the people who told me. Yeah, right. So I know, and they know, that I know. So there would have been a letter signed by certain players saying they could not work with Jim Gannon. But to, sorry, to, no. be, to be fair, I, like on t- I, mean, I only go on Twitter now. I, I lurk on Marion's board actually more, more recently, but there's, there's, <laughs> there's, still, there's still isn't there fans out there that that aren't, aren't keen on Jim? Well, you're always going to get that. I know yeah, you are, but Jesus Christ, he's we've, more we've than... We've talked about this before. We've talked about the fact that there seems to be an undercurrent of people who just, who just took against him as a player. They've yeah. taken against him as a manager, whether they're the same people I suspect they are. And they just will never be swayed. So he was, was, was a hate figure as a player. Yeah, Bo- Boo boy to use the phrase that we always use. And you think there's no reason for it. He wasn't a particularly bad player. He certainly wasn't a bad player in 96, 97. No, but he could. And yet there are yeah, people yeah. who have taken against him for whatever reason. And if the political scene from the last week or so tells us anything, it's people don't like to be proven wrong. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So it's, if, if you make a judgment, whether that be Brexit, I'm not getting into that, but you know, whether it, you make a judgment and you nail your colour to the mask, yeah. Yeah. to then say, actually, you know what? I was fucking wrong about that, or I'm wrong about him. He's quite, it's, it's, some people find that climb down. I don't, I, don't, I mm. personally don't, but some people find that climb down too difficult to do, as, yeah. if, as if it's, you know, it's like they're leaving themselves open. Well, I think during these dark days things, I've spoken a lot, excuse me, about, you have, yeah. about Jim, and I've spoken a lot. <laughs> not as much as me. Well, I'm, <laughs> I, I feel I'm not coming down on either side. I'm not saying that this is wrong because I like Jim. I think this, you know, I'm telling you mm. this is what happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, if, if Jim came in here now, you'd be surprised. If I Jim nice. came in now, <laughs> I think I could still just say to him, look, be, this happened, didn't it, Gaffer? You know, the, the, he would the know. thing about the letter, you know, there's like an old saying in football, he's lost the dressing room. It actually isn't possible for a manager to lose the dressing room unless the manager has lost the chairman. Mm. So if the chairman's right behind, or chairperson is right behind the manager, the players will fucking fall in line no. because they know they can't jump over his head. And to undermine the guy to that extent where somebody's actually said, look, you fucking put a letter together saying that you don't want the manager here. Not only is it a shocking way to treat an absolute legend of the football club, it's a shocking way to treat him, but it actually lets them players off the fucking hook. Well, mm-hmm. the problem being is, I, like all of us, I'd heard that phrase so many times, but now I know how it happens. Yeah. Because I've seen it. You undermine the manager. Win- yeah, because... You know, Jim, by his own admission, is a hard taskmaster. Yeah, There'll course. be lots of players out there who would gladly tell you that he was horrible to yeah. work for, and there'll be just as many who'll say, do you know what? He, he made brilliant me work. Yeah. 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 So you get that in any job. Mm. If you're a manager, there's as many people dislike you yeah, as like you. Yeah. Yeah. So well, you're not there to be liked, no, are you? You're there, you're to, there get to get football results. results yeah. So, But to witness that actually happening was incredible. But something even worse happens in probably on the next page. Right. Let, but, let's, so let's turn over. So no, no, not ready yet. <laughs> oh, okay. So in the next few days, um, 
Brian and Spencer are in the office talking about potential managers. Now, I think you might remember... You mean they didn't fucking have... <laughs> just a minute. <laughs> you, I think you might remember that just a few minutes ago... I said £60,000, you know, Dave. Did, I, just did I not say to pocket. you that a couple of minutes ago that Ryan doesn't start work for two weeks? Anyway, you know, can I just say to our listeners that was actually a genuine <laughs> fucking hell they didn't have it. You didn't know about that, did you? Oh, oh no, God. So, so they were talking about potential managers. Now, to clear that one up a little bit, they already had somebody in mind, but it in wasn't mind. anybody that we knew. And they were talking about this particular person and, and, and Ryan knows this and Ryan knows that and I know Raymond Verheyen and this, that and the other. But... Never in my wildest dreams did I think that he would come up with somebody that we'd never heard of. Um, <laughs> so, of course, Lordy takes the next game. Because Lordy's back. And uh, we won 2-0. Can, uh, can I just against say... Newport, I think, was it? Can I just say at this point as well, um, we didn't get Lordy on last time because he, um, he, he, he said he was poorly. So um, I, did want to, I did want to ask him... How many times he's left and, and come back to the well, club? We'll but, come to that. But, well, unless you've got the figure, no, I I'll, I'll figures, ask him. Yeah. I'll ask him when, when he does come on. I will ask him. So, Lordy takes charge of this game, and we win two 0 And I think it was could have been. I don't know who we beat. Anyway, we beat somebody two 0 Um, but there was a two week gap till the next game, so we didn't have a game the following week, and it wasn't called off. We just didn't have a game. So, in that respect, they planned that well. <laughs> so, they're talking about potential managers. And we've had a few people apply for the job. And Gary Brabin rings me up and said, I'm on a coaching course, but get, you've got my CV, haven't you? Will you chuck it in? So, and he'd, he'd been out of work since he'd left Luton. He would got to the playoff final and, you know, didn't quite get there, but got him to the playoff final. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so we put, I put Gary Brabin forward because... I thought, that set of players in there, knowing what I know and what I've been told about this letter, he's exactly the sort of manager they need because they wouldn't fucking put a letter in front of Gary Brabin, let mm. me tell you that. It's county as well. Yeah. yeah. So Only for a short period yeah, of time, yeah, but, but still, one of Danny's still, signings. Yeah. So anyway, so he goes, he goes on the list and unbeknown to me, Bogey's on the list, but they tell me, oh, we're going to interview him, Bogey. So I'm thinking, well, we don't need to interview anymore. There's two really potential good managers. Bogey's got a good record in this division, took Gateshead up. Brabin's prepared, you know, or he took Gateshead up to that division, I should yeah. say. Um, and I remember, I know it sounds really crass now, but I remember saying, the interview, let me tell you that bit, the interview's Brabs. So, Brabs rings me, and I can't do his accent, I'm terrible at accents, and he's going mental on the phone. Apparently, that pair of idiots who've just interviewed me, he said, I've ended up interviewing them. He said, what they know about football, I've left in the boot of my car. He said, like, they're a pair of fucking clowns. He said, I'm not getting a job. I said, how do you know? He said, I'm fucking telling you, I'm not getting that job. So I'd said to, to Ryan the next day, what happened with uh, Brabs? He went, scared, of, scared the fucking living daylights out of me. He said, couldn't work with him. Couldn't have him in the, in the, as a manager. He terrifies me. And I was like, what? Isn't that what we need? <laughs> because if he terrified you, imagine what he'd do to them players. Like, imagine coming off the pitch and not giving your all and he's waiting for you on the touchline. I said, that's what we need. No, nah, no, nah, he said, well, he, he's not for us. He said, on a, on a positive note, we spoke to Bogey uh, and we like him, but we're not sure he's for us either. I was like, right, okay. He said, but when we tell you who we've got, it's going to knock your socks off. Question for you both. If you could recreate one sporting moment and be there doing it yourself, what would it be? Russ? Winning put in the 1992 Open Championships to replicate Nick Faldo. Golf, though. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah I, I, I don't know, not my thing. But you, Dave? Well, as an amateur, as you well know, so I go and watch cricket. Um, and I was there, along with John Billsbury, friend of the podcast, oh, yes. uh, the Tea Party podcast, and we were both there when uh, Ben Stokes hit the winning runs in the Headingley Test on that famous Sunday a couple of months ago, so I would uh, recreate that. Even I watched that. <laughs> I'm going to have to go for a county moment now, then, aren't I? Um, top of my head, Glenn Taylor's header for Spennymore <laughs> against Chortley, all the way. Get in. So why have you asked us that, Ernie? 
because it's a little message from our new sponsors, the Players Entrance in Merseyway Stockport, where you can go and recreate many sporting moments. And it's run by a county fan. That's, I mean, and it's got Darren Stevenson on the wall. There's a mural of Darren oh, Stevenson indeed. on the wall. Excellent. Doing an overhead kick, I believe. Doing an overhead kick. I'm going to get on for that. I don't want him doing that. Was he actually doing an overhead kick like as a model for the picture? I don't know. Or the picture I've seen with him, he's got his broken leg, so, or whatever he's done. Maybe that's how he broke it. Maybe. Well, he did, didn't it? Right. <laughs> I said, okay. And he says, um, you won't have heard of him. And I said, uh, how's he going to knock my socks off? No, I'm worried. <laughs> so she said, what do you mean? I said, well, if I've never heard of him, and I don't know him, and I don't know of him, he's a foreigner. And he's never worked in this country. And he goes, you got that bit right? I said, so why are we talking to a foreign manager who's never worked in English football because of what he's going to bring to this club? He's done this and he's done that. And I said, does he speak English? He speaks perfect English, better than you and me. I said, well, that's not hard, is it? You know, people, most people speak better English than me. I said, but I'm worried. Don't be worried. He said, the only fly in the ointment is we've asked Bogey to be his assistant, but he's thinking about it. And as we all know, Bogey turned it down. So he'd, he'd gone for the number one job. He wasn't prepared to be somebody's number two. Fair play to him. So, we, <laughs> this is, he's got promises of all these players coming in because he's got all these Scandinavian contacts via his dad and he's got this manager coming in and that. But we get told we've got this guy called Darye Kalasic coming in as our manager. And obviously, Dave. Dave. So we've obviously got to put press out there about him. And I got a phone call from a, a gentleman in the press who said to me that the word going round the conference, National League, whatever you want to call it, I think it was still conference then, was that there's only three relegation places left now. <laughs> because Stockport have definitely just put themselves in one of the relegation places. Every manager at the bottom of the league was pissing themselves laughing. They've just been given a one of them has been given a get out of jail free card. I had at least two or three of those calls. Two from the press and one from a manager of another another club in the league. What's going on at your club? So we <laughs> Darry Darry turns up and I get told, um, can you go, or get asked, not told, will you go and meet Darie at the hotel that he's staying at? Just, you know, introduce him to yourself. So, so, you, so when he comes to the club, you're not, you know, it's not, you're not awkward and all that. So, yeah, not a problem. Um, I've asked Roger to go, Roger Wilde, and uh, he'll meet you at the hotel and a meal and all that. Lot. I said, oh, I don't want a meal. I said, I haven't got time for all that nonsense. I've, when I get home from here, I'll go home, I'll have a quick tea, and then I'll go out. You're not telling me I've got to eat out as well. You know, I'll do, this is out of my hours. I said, and I don't really want to eat with somebody I don't really know, because mm. it's awkward when you, you know, it's not bloody blind date or whatever, it's first date. <laughs> so he said, well, it's all right, I've asked Rob. I said, why don't you ask Rob Clare, because he won't turn down a free meal. And he didn't. <laughs> so <laughs> so the, the thing was, is myself and Roger were meeting Darry in the bar, and then Rob was coming later and he was going to have a meal with Roger and Darrier. I'd done my bit, I'd gone in and sort of done a soft interview and all this lot. So we met in the hotel and I remember it was F Fulham were on the telly. Again, I can't remember who they were playing, but Fulham were on Sky Sports. It must have been a Monday night. And uh, so I get, sit down, get him a drink, chat, introduce myself. Uh, a bit of soft talk, have you got a family, how's your kids and all this lot. And I said, um, so have you got kids? He said, yeah, I've got two, two boys, I think he's got, two little ones. I said, right, so will you, when are they joining you? So he says, uh, they're not. So I said, oh, right. So are you t you're still together as a family? Oh, yeah, yeah, very much so, my wife and my two boys. And they're not joining you? No, no, I'm only here for three months. Uh, £10,000 a month. Yeah. £30,000 he was paid. I'm only here for three months. So that's £60,000 for Ryan, £30,000 for this fucking idiot. So... I've nearly fallen off my chair here. Hang on a minute. We've just sacked Jim Gannon, yep. club legend, kept us up last year, probably going to keep us up this year without any real issues. And we sacked him. <clears throat> we brought in a manager who's never seen a non-league game football at any level in this country. He doesn't know players from 
bloody Parsons. He doesn't know anything. Mm. And we brought him in, and he's only here for three months. And I'm like, wow. And don't forget what he's going to bring to this football club. That's how it was sold to you by Ryan. Oh, yeah. So I said to him, so when you say you're only here for three months, that's obviously till the end of the season. Oh, yeah, I won't be here next season. I'm still struggling. And I'm genuinely, even now, I'm like, can you explain how that works then? Well, I'm going to come in and save the club from relegation and put things in place so that this never happens again. And <laughs> we will bring in coaching staff and players and the club will move forward. And he was very succinct about it. Yeah. And I'm still sat there with my face like this, what, three months? Yeah. You're not staying. And it's not the first three months of the season, <laughs> it's the last three yeah. months of the season and we're already threatened with relegation. And I, I just, honestly, <laughs> and I still can't believe that that actually happened. So, his first it, it game... It happened, Phil. It happened. So his first game on the weekend, we played non-eating at home and we beat them 3-2. Then we lost at Wrexham and we, we were poor, but we were... I think we've always been poor at Wrexham until recently. Since we've been in non-league, we just it's only recent times that we've been able to work out how to beat the Buggers. <laughs> um, then we beat Lincoln, who was down there as well. And we drew away at Ebsfleet, which was quite a result for us. But then we lost three on the bounce and it started to get a bit, you know, what's going on here with this revolution? We, at some stage in this proceedings... We got the striker that was the answer to all of our problems. And I went to pick him up at the airport. Not Chirac. And he was called Adnan Chirac. <laughs> and he had won, allegedly, a shooting shoot for a star competition in some third-rate Swedish backwater TV show. And he was going to be the answer to all our problems. And by this time, I'm really not believing anything. I go and meet him at the airport. <laughs> not believing anything. And I, bl I go to pick him up at the airport and he walks out the airport with what, probably a rucksack at the most, not even a full rucksack at that. And I said, are we waiting for your cases? Cases? Yeah, your cases with all your stuff in. I have no cases. So everything you've got is in that rucksack there, then, yeah. Well, if boots will travel. So, aha, you say that. <laughs> Didn't have any boots. <laughs> so we get Adnan Chirat to the club and we introduce him and we do our little press bit and this, that and the other, and we go... I <laughs> he's got no boots. We get, a, we get... Lando turns up at the club asking for some cash to go and buy some boots for Chirac because he's got no boots. So he's got no boots at all, not even boots that he's brought with him that are a bit knackered and that he's been winning competitions with. He's not even got them. No, he's got no boots. Um, right. Well, I did a deal with Umbro. We've got free boots. Craig Hobson's found them quite easy to score goals. And every time Obbo, Obbo scored, he got another pair of boots. And he went on this great run of scoring goals because he was getting new boots. Oh, no, I can't wear Umbro. I can only wear Adidas Predator. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell. I need two pairs. One pair for training and one pair for the match. And we paid. Was it 800 quid or whatever it is for oh, two pairs of Predator hell. boots? So how many goals did he score? One. One, I think. One, and it was too late by then, wasn't it? But, so yeah, so that was him. And again, around the same time, John Macken turns up. Now, I didn't know John at the time, but I kept in touch with him and we, we see each other about and he's doing a good job at Radcliffe now. But So Macken turns up and you, you obviously you have to go and interview him. So we're having a chat. We went and had a coffee and I, I said, uh, I'd done a bit. He's not played football. He'd played two games for yeah. Northwich Vicks at the beginning of the season. He was and, so out of, oh yeah. out of shape. So mm. I said he's obviously to, a class player. So I'm thinking he's coming in to help with the training. Because, oh, I missed, a bit, I missed a bit. I do this a lot. We haven't got an assistant manager. I haven't mentioned him yet, have I? No, no. That's because nobody can remember him. So we get... Because Bogey's turned it down, we're struggling now. We've got a press conference on whatever day it is and we've got no assistant manager. Bloody hell, what are going to do? Get a phone call on the night. We've got, we've got somebody. Good lad. 
I said, right. It turned out he was, to be fair. So he said, um, Stuart Watkiss. Oh, that's his name. Can you write Can you write up a piece for the website for the morning? I said, what about a photograph? Well, we need it on the website first thing in the morning. So I said, well, I can't really show, do a piece about the new, and, and we haven't seen him. So I did a bit of digging. And it turns out he'd been at Grimsby and the lad at Grimsby, Dale, was a good pal. So I rang Dale and said, listen, have you got any photographs of Stuart Watkins I can use? He went, oh, is he at your place now? And then I said, it's hush hush till tomorrow. But he is, he's coming in as assistant manager. What's he like? Fucking great. Proper, good lad. Good with the players. Players will love him. Knows what he's doing. He's a good coach. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, so I said, all oh, right, well, where's he been? He said, oh, he's been at Hull. And apparently he was part of Barnby's hull. So it turns out he's on garden leave. And he had been on garden leave. So he sends me a couple of pictures and the, the, the press cut, the press release goes on the website first thing in the morning with a picture of him in a Grimsby-ish top, which you cut out. But And then I go to the ground to meet him after training. So we're having a chat. And I said, so uh, I spoke to Dale. He said to say hello. And he said, all oh, right, great, lovely lad, Dale. I said, uh, yeah, he said, everybody at Grimsby had nothing but nice things to say about it. He said, oh, that's lovely, that. He said, funny enough, he said, I saw Dale a couple of weeks ago, he said, uh, when I was jogging up the beachfront at Grimsby at Cleethorpes. He said, but I was running, so I didn't have time to stop. I said, what were you doing, jogging on Cleethorpes front? He went, well, I was at the end of my um, garden leave from Hull, and I thought to myself, I need to get fit, because I need to get a job. He said, because I've been out of the game for six months, so I need to get back. I said, all oh, right, great. So how did you end up here? He went, Ryan's dad rang me and said, do you want a job? There's one going at Stockport County. <sighs> oh, fucking hell. So I will say that Stuart was actually not bad. Yeah. La- yeah. I got yeah. on well with him. He's doing a great job. I think he's the assistant manager at Bangladesh now. He's, he's you know, he got good qualifications. Yeah. And he brought in Mark Cullen, who nearly kept us up on his yeah, own. Yeah, yeah. You know, he brought him in from Hull. So Stuart knew what he was doing, but straight away from pretty much day one, him and Darrier didn't seem to get on. Can, can, I think we'll. I'll, I'll tweet a picture of the press conference because some of the um, no it's, context. It's, and, it's and, magnificent. And, f- it? and some of the funny accounts on Twitter <laughs> have been doing the rounds. So, so cheers to the lads that have been doing that. It's, it's really good content. So I'll, I'll tweet a picture of that, and it is. You can just tell by by that. <laughs> can't you? Yeah. Yeah. So one of the reasons they didn't get on was that Darrier wanted to introduce Sunday training the day after a game. Now, we don't do that over here. No. <laughs> but he wanted to do it because it was continental. It was a continental... What it, it, and is he bringing it in in a relegation battle? So For three he's, months. <laughs> he's already telling the players, you've got to do it this way. And, you know, I'm not saying that they were the best players in the world. I'm not saying they would have kept us up without him. They probably would have done. But they weren't... They just <laughs> couldn't seem to agree on anything. And Stuart got caught up in that where he was on the players' side... Yeah, well, it's part of the job, isn't it? It's but he was, buffer, also, isn't it? he was also going against the manager yeah. because he couldn't get the players to agree to train yeah. on Sunday because he was saying to the players, look, I don't want to train on Sunday either, lads. <laughs> so, but apart from that, you know, it, so we've got an assistant manager. Anyway, John Macken has turned up and I'm thinking maybe he's coming in as a, a player coach type thing. I said, anyway, what, how have you ended up here, John? Well... He said, I'm sat at home one day, watching the afternoon telly, Jerry McHale or whatever. <laughs> Jerry McHale. And he says, and I get a phone call off Spencer Fern. Right, John, got your number off such as body. What are you doing? So I'm not doing anything. He said, we're looking for a striker. Come yourself down, get yourself fit and you'll be in the team. So that's what John Macken tells me. So he turns up. And to be fair to him, over a period of time, he finally gets fit and didn't do bad once he was in. But he was so, and by his own admission, he was fat. so far <laughs> overweight, so out of condition, but he just he loved being back around football. Fun fact, you know when he scored against Macclesfield oh, away? Oh, he just pinched it. Go on. <laughs> go on. No, no, we're gone. No, I was going to say, um, on Soccer Saturday, I was at the match so I didn't see it, but someone messaged me. On Soccer Saturday, for some reason, it came through a Jimmy Floyd of Hasselbank. That's Florida's. right, I remember that. I remember that. <laughs> We, Some um, sort of data coding gone wrong there. Really. <laughs> See, but you've you've already preempted it because that was after Darrier. But oh, was it? Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> That's post. All the timelines are in, are in. So anyway, so we've lost three on the bounce. 
and we're playing Dartford away, and it's a, one of the very rare occasions because it's a night match where we all travel on the same coach because there's no point in saying two cars and loads of coaches. And as we get to the hotel, we stayed on one side of the tunnel. Um, we didn't stay in the Dartford side, whichever side it is, where the other club is. Epsley, is it? I think it's Epsley. So we stayed there, a hotel there, for a, an afternoon lunch and this, that and the other. And Stuart sat opposite me, nowhere near the rest of the team. I can't remember. I think Cash, Cashy and... I can't remember. who was on our table, JK and that. And I said, look at him there. He doesn't look well at all. And he was white as a sheet. He looked like he'd been dragged up. So I went over to him, you all right, Stuart? He went, no, I'm just not well. I'm really not well. I said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to try and have a kip and see how I feel later. So later on, coach is ready to go. Stuart's still at the hotel. I look at him. I said, he said, I'm not traveling. He said, I'm, I've gonna, I'll make my own way to the ground after and I'll get on the coach coming home. He said, I have no way I'm coming to the game. So we're playing Dartford away. It would, again, I think they were down there with us. Or they were certainly they were better than us anyway at the time. And we've no assistant manager. We've got a first team manager who doesn't really know what he's doing, if the truth be known. We've got no assistant manager. And John Macken, who'd only just joined the club, ended up being unofficial assistant manager alongside Jordan Felgate who was the goalkeeper coach and we got a one-all draw somehow we got a one-all draw and it was again it was a, it wasn't a bad result in the context of things and then we played Mansfield away and Stuart had got to the game because it was his old club and he's a legend at Mansfield allegedly apparently and, but I think as a player and a coach he'd done a good job at Mansfield so he was desperate to get there he wasn't so desperate once we'd been spanked 4-1. I remember <laughs> talking to him after the game and he said, I wish I'd stayed at home in bed. Um, there was two things about that game. Paul Marshall scored the goal of the season and it was an unbelievable goal, pretty much halfway line. But the funniest bit about it was before the game, we'd, at the ground, he'd pitched up in um, Micah Richards. Marshall was at City as a kid. So he'd remain friends with people like Micah Richards and people like that. He'd turned up at Edgeley Park in Micah Richards' Bentley for a game in the fourth, in the fifth division. And he'd parked it right outside the ground and I'd said to him, are you leaving that there? <laughs> <laughs> it's not mine, yeah. I said, it won't be yours when you get back either. <laughs> I said, that won't be there when you come back. You can't just park it on double yellows anyway. But anyway, so it turned out it was Micah Richards' car. But yeah, he scored a great goal. But we lost 4-1. And the next game was the, the really, for me, the, the season-defining game. We go to Barrow midweek and we win 2-0. I think Mark Cullen, me, I think he got them both. The funny thing about that night was Danny Rowe, big Danny Rowe, Sean McConville, Danny O'Donnell, possibly one other, were all playing for Barrow. And that was the night when McConville got all the stick about being in the money. And we beat them 2-0 and we beat them fair and square. And it was easily the best performance for a long, long time in a county shirt for many of them. And so you think, oh, things are turning again. Mm. And we play Braintree at home on the Saturday. And I don't know how long before the game, but not long before the game, I see a few of the players who played at Barrow still got the jeans and t-shirt or the track suits on they're not changed for playing football in a game that you'd think they were playing in because we beat Barrow 2-0 on Wednesday night but no 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 we've brought four players in when I say we've brought four players in the manager didn't bring any players in in his period in control because he didn't know any players Stuart brought as I say brought Mark Cullen in but I don't think of any other players he brought in. So somebody else, or two other people, were bringing footballers to the club. Um, can you remember them? <laughs> the footballers or the, the two people? The footballers. <laughs> um, no, is the answer to that. No idea. Dave? No. Right, well. <clears throat> so, let me do them in order. <laughs> Javan Vidal. Oh yeah, remember him? 
He'd been at City as a kid. He'd been playing in Greece. Well, when I say he'd been playing in Greece, he'd been in Greece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Actually, I don't mean a musical. Yeah, yeah. He'd yeah, been yeah. in Greece and not played yeah. any football. Trying to get trials and, th- yeah. and things he like that. He was atrocious. So he... Oh, I get... There's another one on him. So he comes in, straight in the team. Um... Lee Bullock, who we brought in on loan from York, and in fairness to Lee Bullock, actually was good for the rest of the season. Had a lot of time for Lee Bullock. It was a model professional. He'd been told by York he wasn't part of their plans. He'd gone on loan to another club, and he gave us commitment, and he was a decent player. So we'll give him a tick. Kieran Charnock on loan from Fleetwood Town, who again, mostly, was good for us at that period yeah, of time. Yeah, yeah. Straight in the team. Conference That's North player, though, in the end, I think. So, yeah. Three players straight in the team. Yeah, but Fleetwood were a football league club. I know they were, yeah. But as it panned out, I mean, yeah. for so, but Yeah, but at that period of time, we're yeah. in the conference, and yeah, better yeah. than what we've got, because yeah. we're struggling. Yeah. Anyway, so then he's sort of a tick. I'll give you that. He's, he's not a full tick, he's a sort mm. of... And then we had this former superstar called Danny Schofield who came in on loan from Rotherham United via Spencer's contacts because Spencer's got lots of contacts at Rotherham United and Danny Schofield apparently he's on two grand a week and we're getting him for one <sighs> now that was the figure I heard it might not have been one but it was still more money than he was he a had quid. been a good player a quid a five week five or so years earlier a quid a week would have been too much yeah but anyway so he comes straight Boom. in the team and apparently, having spoken to somebody at Rotherham at the time, he was training with not the youth team, but a junior team. Because apparently his, um, at, his attitude was so poor at Rotherham, he was just like, you're paying me, so I'll just do what I want. And I did actually raise that at the time, that we're bringing in a bad apple from another club into a team of players that are already quite easy to push about and you know if, if the following bad habits why are we bringing other players in but the frightening thing is we've won 2 nil away from home we've changed four players from that team I, I must admit until I really looked I always thought we changed five but Macken was already there so he was on the bench and we get beat the first 20 minutes of that game but, was hysterical but before the game a player, unnamed, comes to me and says, you won't fucking believe what's happening there. And I said, well, what's happened? He said, I've been dropped. And I said, what do you mean you've been dropped? Well, not just me. There's four of them. Four of us are dropped. And one of the other players said, yeah, and I'm not even in the squad. He said, I was on the bench the other night. I'm not even on the bench. Because they filtered down. I went, I understood him not being on the bench because, you know, he was a young kid as well at the time. But the others have gone from being in the team and winning and everybody's buzzing to being dumped out for four players who've not even trained Train. as part of the squad. Mm. I said I asked Darrie about the play. I said, all oh, four players, that's a big move. I'm told they're good. Huh. Sorry? I'm told that all four of them are good players. Oh right. So they've not they're not part of your your match day plan. You've not no, no, they only turned up at training last night, but I'm told they'll be fine. It sounds like e- football even if, even if they were really good players, you'd never put four strangers in a team no. that's already low on confidence. So this player says to me, I'm going to tell you what's happened in the dressing room. I said, what? He said, Darie has read the team out and has said, these four new players are in the team. Don't have a go at me. I don't pick the team. So, I, I, that's exactly what I did. I, what? I said, I'm telling you, Phil, that's what's happened. He's just told the dressing room. So, that means there's at least 16 people have heard the manager say, I don't pick the team. Yeah, yeah. If you need to speak to anybody, speak to Ryan. This is what they said. So, i am gone off. I've completely gone off on one. They have didn't run. even need any bins put in that one. There was so, so I've gone straight to the... And honestly, this is exactly what I went straight to the boardroom yeah. and asked if I could speak to Peter Snape because I'm livid now. Because I'm like, this is not just stupid. This is 
it's, it's got to be against every rule going. You can't do this. So I asked Peter Snape, and Peter Snape comes out to talk to me, so he must have known there was something wrong for me to want to speak to him. So I, I said, Peter, the players, two players, and I named them to him, have just told me that Darie has told the dressing room that he hasn't picked today's team. Ryan has picked the team. And we've made four changes from the team that won for 2 0 at Barrow. And to be fair to him, he went off. He said, I'm not having that. And, you know, he just he went off and. He did have it though, didn't he? Because that's well, exactly well, so what he, happened. He goes off and does it. As a, and I don't hear anymore. I've, I've, I'm gone to sit down and calm down because it's destroying the football yeah. game. It's not, it's not just people like coming in and bringing the mates in and this and that. They're destroying. Was you, getting, the football was you game. angry at this point? Oh, very, very angry. Yeah. And still angry now, and I don't. We're not worked there for years, but yeah. that happened. As God is my witness, that happened. Fuck it now. So, and I'm quite happy to tell people off air who the players were because they'll back me up. Because yeah. I've spoken to them since, so I know that that happened. So, we we get beat. As I'd say, was it three one or something? I can't. The, the first the first twenty minutes, it was it was hilarious. I mean, don't mean it was funny. But it was just hilarious that a football team would do that to themselves. You know, it was just like... There was a strange atmosphere once the team was announced, I'll tell you. Everyone that. was completely... From where, where I was in the press box, it was like a total state of I was in I was in a Cheetahland. Uh, Cheetahland? Yeah, was it Cheetahland? Yeah, it's called Cheetahland. Yeah, Cheetahland, yeah. <laughs> <And> <laughs> that, um, that, that, big, that big bit behind Yeah, 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 I think, yeah. I was in there and I, I think I'd arrived at the ground, like, you know, five minutes before and I didn't know the, the t- what the team was. And I'm thinking, I, d- I don't know who these players are. And we'd had a, quite a sort of churn of players anyway. I thought, and what's going on? And uh, what's he called? The liver guy used to sit next to me. He went, he's just... The liver? He said, he's just fucking unbelievable. He said, have you not heard? They've not even fucking trained. Never mind, like, you know. And, they, and, and of course, that's exactly what it looked like. Yeah. It looked like they, they, they weren't even sure what side they were on. <laughs> they just, I mean... I spoke after the game and asked Peter Snape what had happened. And I said, did you speak to Ryan? Yeah, I did. I said, and what happened? He said, he denied it. Oh, well, that's all right then. And that was it. It was There was a, a denial. What can I do? I can't prove it. Well, you could go and ask any one of those 16 players in there. That's the manager. But anyway, so that was that, that happened and we got beat. And... The, I think that was when Stuart resigned because he'd not been well, not been well a while, and I just don't think he was. He was the wrong person, the right person at the wrong, wrong time. time. Yeah. Because he was, you know, I'd, anybody who worked with him would tell you he was okay. You know, I mean, I don't know as a player, but all the players I spoke to seemed to like him. Yeah. Um, so we needed a new assistant manager. I bet you can't guess who came in as assistant manager. God, you're testing now. You can have one guess, and you'll be so embarrassed if you get it wrong. I'll be so embarrassed. Yeah, everybody will. Everybody will be. Everybody listening. I'm going to say Lordy. Well done. Oi! <laughs> <laughs> the Red Adair of Stockport. Yeah. So, we, before we go on to Lordy's first game back at the club, death threats. Somebody <laughs> mentioned death threats. So, we've lost at home to Braintree. The rumours are going round, like you said, it was already in the stand that that Darier wasn't picking the team. Now, that's not come from us. We're up in the press box. It's got around the ground. And these people not happy with Ryan. And at this time, people were already not happy with him anyway. And I, I get told uh, in the morning when I get in the office, Ryan says, oh, you're not going to believe this. I've had a death threat and I started laughing <laughs> and he was like what are you laughing at? I said really? You've had a death threat? He said genuinely I said when? On Twitter last night I said oh hang on a minute I said I was watching that last night on Twitter it was it was quite funny to be fair it wasn't funny for me I said well don't engage him you know, why are you doing it? Why are you going on there pontificating keep winding people up they're going to come back and people... He said, 
well, I've had a death threat and I've told the chairman and he's going to do something about it. I said, well, that's a stupid thing to do. Because next minute we're going to have to put, he's going to be telling me we've got to put a press release out and I'm not going to do it because you've not had a death threat. I have. I said, you haven't. I've seen, I've seen the tweet you're talking about. I've saved it. I know what the tweet is. It says, why doesn't Ryan McKnight fuck off and die? Yeah, that's the one. I said, that's not a death threat. <laughs> it's a well, it's not list. very nice. I said, it's not very nice. I said, no, it's not. But it's not a death threat. As a Tory, whenever I'm down in London and I find myself short of quail's eggs, I head down to Covent Garden to replenish my stock. And if I want eggs in Stockport, I head to at Covent Garden. 94 Lower Hillgate, in the heart of Stockport Old Town. Come and visit at Covent Garden for quality breakfast and lunch, fantastic coffee, cakes, light snacks, and above all, a friendly place with great service. Open match days. Anyway, then the minute, next minute you've got Peter Snape on the phone. Right, I want you to take this now. I need to put this on. The, and I said, I'm not, we're not doing it. We cannot put on our website that the chairman or the, the chief exec has had a death threat. So instead, I think he went in the paper, didn't it, Dave? It went in evening news and all over the BBC. Yeah. Stockport County Chairman reveals death threats to board. Says some of the club's directors have been the subject of death threats. Plural. Plural. Yeah. But th there's never any details. This is the thing that, that, that gets me. I mean, if that's, if that's what it was that you're saying, that somebody's just said, I wish you'd fuck off and die. Why don't you just fuck off and die? It it's said. offensive. It's not nice. All the rest of it. It's not a death threat, like you've just said. Mm. But because the word death threat will get headlines. Mm. It's a piece of piss for him to ring up a journalist and say, I've had death threats. Give all these quotes which are in the thing. When some internet sites carry death threats against particular individuals, it certainly isn't worth it. He insisted the club will not hesitate to prosecute or ban anyone using threatening behaviour. We started putting more security on as well, didn't we? Yeah, there was a, this thing about um, Stockwell County to beef up security for directors after alleged threats. But journalists will lap this up. Oh, yeah. You say death, death threats, you've written two pages from them, they could put their feet up and go home. Because... You know, you don't have to prove it. You don't have to go to a court of law. You don't have to say, here's the death threats, here's this person, here's the gun he bought, here's the, the plan he put in place to, to go and take me out. You know, because he's, he's just said, I'll put you fuck off and die on a website. No. But he just, I, I, I remember saying to Ryan, Sweet. look, Ryan, I know these people. <laughs> I had to stop myself saying, they're my people. No, <laughs> they, I know these people. Yeah, but they are, they are well, your yeah. people. To, to <laughs> Most extent. of these people, and I said to him, none of them will kill you. None of them. And he went, are you sure? I said, yeah. Some of them will really hurt you badly, <laughs> but none of them will kill you. <laughs> and he was like, you're not taking this seriously. I said, because it's not serious. But unfortunately it was, because next minute it's old sky bloody news and to, everything. To be honest, there's, there's two ways of looking at this. It's either someone being cynical and thinking, oh, you've, you've, you've dropped a clanger there because I can now go to the press and I can hammer you because of these alleged death threats. Or the other alternative, he genuinely thinks they were death threats and was genuinely worried, in which case, what was he on again? How much money was he on? Still on. £60,000. <laughs> and he's as dumb as, dumb as, as, that, as you yeah. like to, 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 to genuinely think that. So he either genuinely thinks that and he's, he's dumb, or he doesn't think it and he's being cynical. And neither of them's a good look. Yeah. I, I like think it. he's a cynical dumb cunt. <laughs> <laughs> so, back to the football. So we're playing Luton away from home. And, again... <laughs> Another night match where we all go on the coach. But we've got a pal with us now, Lordy, who sat on the... I, was, I mean, it was just lovely to have Lordy back. And it was weird because he sat with Darier, but you could tell he wanted to sit with us. <laughs> he was sat with Darier there, and there was me, Liggins, JK. Right, so we're on the coach. Lordy sat with Darier, acquainting himself with him because he only arrived at the club that afternoon Lord he hadn't trained or anything you know what I mean we brought I'm him I'm surprised he put him in the first team <laughs> so, um, so we go to Luton and we get there we stop for a meal and Lord he comes and sits with us and he starts getting involved in all the banter about how things you know, we'll, we'll have to start turning it round and all this lot you could tell that Lord he was back at the club because Jordan Fagbola Alex Kenyon Matty Mainware and Simon Ackley were all in the start of the 11 so players that he knew about were all in. And there's, straight away, you know, you brought somebody in who's never worked with Darry, and Darry's saying, well, you need to drop him, 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 and these lads will do me a job. They'll do it for me. Yeah. <laughs> so They'll do what I ask them to do, and so, I'll know what to ask them to do. So Vidal gets the runaround from the very first attack, and 
gets himself booked for taking the winger out within, I think, within 15 minutes. He's been run, ra- run ragged. He's given he's give free kicks away. He's got himself booked and then asked to be subbed. He goes off after 20 minutes and I can't remember who came on. But this is a player who's come in looking to build a future at the club and has gone, do you know what? And he's off. Um, we lost 1-0. They scored just before the break and I think it might have been Steve McNulty from a corner. But we lost 1-0 and the difference in performance was there to see that Lordy's influence was different. Anyway, on the coach on the way home, it was quite obvious that Darier knew he's, he wasn't coming back after that game. And he was heard on his phone making arrangements to meet his wife and kids. And we're all looking at each other going, is he on the phone to he's going home? So, so he, we knew he was getting a sack because he told us he wasn't, he, you know, he was as good as told us on the bus that this is me talking to my wife saying, I'll see you tomorrow. Um, and that was him. He'd gone. So I don't know. Should we finish with his stats? Yeah. Yeah, so, go for it. So DK's stats, 12 games. Won three, drew two, lost seven. We got 11 points from 36, which cost us our place in that division as far as I'm concerned. Yes. Because that 12 games, under any other manager, and I mean any other manager, would have kept us in that division. So I think, from my point of view, that's pretty much, if we can end where DK departs and we'll pick it up from there yeah I think that's a good place to stop um, so yeah we'll end it there well, what makes me laugh just before you go it, it's hilarious that some of the feedback we're getting on Twitter from people are saying we did the first one I can't believe it was that bad did the <laughs> yeah, second one yeah. bloody hell I listened to the first one I didn't think it would get any worse and it did the third one people hearing that tonight will be thinking where's it going from here yeah well, and, and there's still a lot of fucking shit all this t- we, before we get to the end of this season yeah I mean we're I think we've got seven games left yeah but there's a lot still happens and there's, there's the close season and there's that so I think you know part and part, part a, 4B will be just as entertaining well, uh, we've got Kidderminster yeah to talk about <laughs> yeah we've got that what did we go down what were the points what, we go down by at the end points wise we, well, we, we couldn't stay up on the last day because no no but I mean teams, overall we, I we, think we I think it was four points. But to go back to what you were saying about Darius' time, 12 out of 33, was it yeah. 36? But we've got those four yeah. points there easily, like you say, with any other manager. I genuinely so think that if... For, because we drew with Gateshead, then we had to beat Kidderminster who were going for the title. Mm. And Gateshead had to lose, but I think Gateshead won anyway. Yeah, yeah I think one of the other teams did as well, yeah. didn't they? But, yeah, I mean, as I say, yeah. th- those 12 games, and in all honesty, that change of team from Barrow to Braintree you know no no team that's struggling gets an away win 2-0 and then changes four players Crazy. No. I tell you the theme that's coming out to me across all these podcasts I knew a lot of it anyway through talking to you beforehand but this stuff you know, that's new to me is the self-inflicted nature of yeah. every yeah. single yeah. thing Yeah, it's so self-inflicted you didn't have to do that but we did you didn't have to do that but we did at any point if you had not done one of those things we would have, would have, been, better, would have been different, and probably. Been yeah, yeah. Part time. Oh, no, and I've been saying for a long, I've been saying for a long time. You know, these are not bad people. They're just shit. Can I just throw a little positive in, right around the Christmas period? I know we. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was going to end on a positive and play some play right. some Christmas music. <laughs> <laughs> well, around the Christmas period, which yeah. was before Darie, obviously, we'd the big shop was going so well, thanks to Mister Cree and other people that had come back on board. I was approached by Umbro as being next season's kit supplier. And uh, I knew the guy from Umbro and uh, I said to him, well, what have you got to offer? He said, well, your kit deal's coming to an end, isn't it? He said, how's about we give you some stuff to put in the shop for Christmas as a tester? So went to, me and Lando, we go to the Umbro place and they come up with this, they show us this, um, I don't know what they call it, when it's a single colour badge. Because I'm a bit thick like that. Monaco. 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 So yeah. he shows, like City had it on the shirt, didn't he? Because so they were umbro. So he shows me all this stuff and he said, I said, oh, it's great that day, but we can't afford it. He went, you can afford this. He said, it's going to be really good stuff. He said, we'll do it a proper deal. 
but we'll need paying up front. And I was like, oh, Dave, mm-hmm. you've just blown it out of the water. <laughs> so I ring the late, great Mike Copper from Help the Hatters, and I said, Top man, by the I way. said, Mike, I really need your help. He said, how much? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I need a lot of help. He went, no, how much money? <laughs> so you know me really well, don't you? He went, what is it? So I told him, so I can get this kit off Umbro, and they'll put it in the club shop, and it'll fly out. And then we've got a deal with Umbro in place for next year. I can't remember the exact figure, but it was a couple of grand. It wasn't just pennies. Mm. So we bought um, managers' coats, polos, hoodies, little nice tracky top, lots of stuff. It was really good quality stuff, but it was all leisure wear. It was nothing to do with the kit because yeah, yeah. we didn't want the guys who were still doing the, <laughs> the Nike kit to get. So I don't even remember when you walked in the big shop, it was all on the left. And they were these, and they were really smart stuff. And we made, I think I'm quite happy to say that we made 50% on everything because we got such a good deal from them. They were really looking at getting our long term deal. Yeah, yeah. So they cut the cost of everything. And I'd asked Spencer if I could do it, and he said, no, we can't afford it. And that's why I rang my copper. So, anyway, after Christmas, Spencer comes, we got a game at Christmas whenever it must have been the Hyde game. Spencer comes in the club shop and he he's looking at what's left on the rack of the Umbro stuff and he goes, I thought I told you not to get this. I said, yeah, but he said, I told you, we can't afford to be spending money on stuff like this. I said, it's already paid for. So I said, what do you mean it's already paid for? I said, that's the second lot. What? I said, yeah, I borrowed the money off Help the Atters for the first lot and we sold it all, and we ordered another lot, and I paid for it up front with the cash that we made off the first lot, and that lot is already flying out, and if you check the till receipts and all that lot, we're making a lot of money on just on the Umbro stuff. It's flying out, and people are, I see people still wearing like the manager's coats and stuff like that. So we made, from, I think I said it last time, the previous two seasons... The, the profit from the club shop was about 250 quid for two seasons the deal was that poor that the club actually made 250 quid profit over two seasons I've got the figures so I know it's true I know I'm jumping forward a bit but that full season of having the big shop with Umbro and all the other things we made £24,000 profit in one season because we had people in there who not just me, people with ideas, people like Steve Cree helping us. So it wasn't all doom and gloom. It was just doom and gloom where football was concerned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But even the club shop in the next episode, you'll find that that changed as well. Yeah. But, but it's always, sorry, just to finish off, it's always been a bugbear of mine. When we was in the in the uh, cubby hole or whatever, whatever call the it, rabbit hutch. the rabbit hutch, it's, you know, to have to have the, the pictures up taken down by sail sharks in the ground or the pictures were taken down weren't they and I'd be, be put into that little cubby hole and then skip, they? I don't, I, well I think we talked about it on, the, on another podcast but yeah just to, just to get back into that big shop for me as a fan that's a massive thing for you because it's like a big statement isn't it you've yeah. got your ground back you know um, I mean it was a great move and you know I am going to big myself up it was me that made it happen and round of, uh, round of applause yeah. <laughs> but no, you know, it wasn't. I made it happen, but then everybody else contributed. And as I say, people like Steve were brilliant. Okay, so we'll end it there. So Ryan's still at the club. Darius just been sacked, um, or or been let go, or no, whatever it is. I think he got sacked. I think <laughs> he says didn't. that. Came the end of his three month contract, yeah. didn't he? Right. No, he didn't. <laughs> no, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think we'll leave it there. Okay. And we'll wish everybody a happy Christmas even though these are dark days. <laughs> <laughs> um, They're not that dark. We're still alive, aren't we? We are now, yeah. So well, um, thanks, uh, yeah. thanks for your... And we'll uh, we'll come back in the new year uh, for Dark Days Part 4B. <laughs> <laughs> we'll call it... Well, whatever. We'll, More whatever, death threats. Whatever, whatever. We'll call it. <laughs> All right, cheers, everybody. See you Bye. now. See Welcome to Scarf Begar War, proudly sponsored by the Players' Entrance at Covent Garden Cafe and the Royal Oak Edgerly.
Oh, great flick up by Alan Armstrong. 